Hi, I'm Mary Lou Belli. I am one of the directors on Black Lightning and NCIS New Orleans and The Secret of Sulphur Springs, as well as I've directed a show called Legacies, amongst many, many others. And I am so happy to be here and part of Neil Before Pod. Neil Before Blog presents Neil Before Pod. Welcome to Neil Before Pod, the podcast that is coming live to you from Universe 838. Or are we? Who's to say? I'm your host, Craig. I have taken back the podcast. I have wrestled it back. I dreamwalked to my other self in order to steal it. But with me is still the same guest to talk about this thing. Aaron, hello. I want a different number. I'm going to be from a different universe. Can I have my own? 414, that'll do. 414. Should have been 404 and then it's not found. Oh, yeah. Ter- okay, yeah. Your joke, but I'll steal it happily enough. <laughs> Bit of an internet reference joke there. And I didn't say what we're here to talk about. But in case you didn't get that from that intro, we are here to talk about Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Bit of a mouthful of title, but we're here to talk about it. There's a new Marvel film in cinemas shortly before there's due to be another new Marvel film in cinemas. So we're here to talk about it. A little bit late to the party, but we're here. So why don't we just start off with spoiler-free thoughts on this latest entry into the universe. What did you think? I didn't like this at all. I did not like this film, I have to say. I didn't think it was a very well done thing. I thought it was a good sound and light show. It looked amazing but there was barely anything that i thought qualified as a script the character development was non-existent they stomped all over the character's previous outings their history is as if it didn't really matter and i appreciate what sam raimi brought to it i I do get that for those people unlike myself that have seen like evil dead and like that i do appreciate his horror and his style of humor was in there so fair play to that but i don't think that made up for the pretty naff script, to be honest. I liked this a lot. I wasn't sure what to expect from it, or I was sure what to expect from it. I think one thing that we'll talk about, and that I said in my review, is that pretty much everybody going into this film will have had some kind of expectation of it based on the hype and the trailers and so on. And I don't think anybody will get what they expected from it, for good or for bad. I expected a script, damn it. That's what I expected. Is that unfair? Is that unreasonable? I don't think so. In this era of filmmaking, who knows? Let's have larger discussion. Do you really need a script? Oh, what was it you were saying in the previous podcast? There are some people from Doctor Who that decided they didn't need a plot anymore. Sure, that was you. Uh, Maybe. I don't know. Maybe it was another conversation. I'm sure two writers of Doctor Who came out in some point and said, we've discovered that we don't need plot anymore. We just put things magically on the page and they turn into amazing episodes. To me, they just joined the people of Lost at that point when Lost said, oh, yeah, we don't have a plan. No, we just make this stuff up as we go along. All of these people need put together in a room and the door locked, if I'm honest. What, so they can brainstorm other scripts that somehow get made? I don't know. I don't want to open it again. I can do what I like in there and they can all enjoy each other. But that's where it needs to stay. <laughs> well, I do think this did have a bit of a script. It was, it was fraught with problems from day one almost. And I think we'll get to that when we discuss the nitty gritty of it. But I, th- I do think it, uh, it had a fairly simple story that it told quite well. I can't really say any more until we cast a spoiler spell or go to the spoiler universe or whatever spoiler thing we're going to do. So shall we just hop, skip and jump to do that? Can do. Okay, we are into spoilers. So let's start with our title character, Stephen Strange, the not Sorcerer Supreme, as it turns out. You said this stepped on the previous appearances of this character, or was it not this character you're referring to, but you said it contrasted what had come before. So can you go a bit into what you meant by that, and if it did indeed relate to Stephen? I think it did relate to Stephen. It made me think of Mortal Kombat. And by that, I need to tell the audience that I'm older than the audience is. I don't mean the most recent Mortal Kombat. I mean the original one. 
and it had a sequel, which had the same problem with the main character for me, that the main character goes to the first film and learns a lesson. And then in the second film, they have to reset them and get them to learn that lesson because they couldn't think of another plot. I thought Stephen Strange here had a similar problem. He goes through quite a lot in not only the first Doctor Strange film, but also through all of his dealings with the Avengers and dealing with the Mad Titan and so forth. But then when we come back to this film and he's by himself, they ask him to learn the lessons of his own arrogance again. And that to me is just cheap. It's something that should have evolved and moved on. The character has made so many different choices and been through so many different adventures since then that I, I don't want to see him coming back and having to just deal with an old problem that isn't there anymore. And it hints of that development with America Chavez that he has moved on to another problem, that he's no longer arrogant. He does have a certain humility built into him, but he is making the hard calls and potentially that does stop him accessing human emotions. Maybe he might take things too far. It's connected to his arrogance. I do get that, but it's an evolution of it. If you just bring back all the same old stuff, though, with Christine and just say, oh, you're the same old strange. No, well, no, he's not the same old strange. I didn't think that they did enough then to give me what his current character is. They just thrashed out his old characteristics. And when he turns round to you at the end and says, oh, I was afraid, and I'm now no longer afraid, it's just a sentence. Where in this whole film did we see him being afraid? And I know it's not the classic afraid of, I'm scared of the dark. That's not what it is. He's afraid of making the wrong decisions. He's afraid of letting go of control. I do understand what the fear is, that it's it's not a, a normal fear. But I still think I wanted to see that in the plot. I wanted to see that in his dealings with Christine. But she's barely in the script. So she needed to be there a lot more in order to actually show some sort of problem with the connection between those characters. Or I wanted to see it with Wanda. How was he afraid of Wanda's power? He was afraid of Wanda's power just smiting the universe. Turns out he needn't have bothered, though, because she was controlled by the plot force. So who cares? She's not going to be able to defeat you. Plot force says she can't. She could have been afraid of America. But America was this one-dimensional character that didn't get anything to do. So he can't make any connection to that character either. So this line that comes in at the end, I was afraid, that was the Stephen Strange who had the car accident. That was not the Stephen Strange that we saw in this film after Thanos, after Avengers, after even having to make a decision in his previous self that this strange got to see in a dream. None of that came up. So I honestly believe that this wasn't really Doctor Strange, Multiverse of Madness. This was random sorcerer in the Multiverse of Madness. They could have had any character in this film flitting through time and space and universes. Any magician would have fitted. You didn't really see anything of Stephen himself. And maybe you'd say, oh, but you saw Demon Strange. I forget what his actual name is. Zombie Strange. I can't even remember now, but the evil one. And his arrogance made him open the book. I oh, know, but it, again, it's a cheap line. It's just a line. There's no development. Why did he open the book? What was different? What went on here? Why do I know that this strange is better than that strange? Oh, because you told me at the end. Okay, fair enough. I didn't see anything of the other strangers and what made them make their choices. What is it about Christine's death that affected those three different Stephen Strangers in different ways? What is it about their trip through Avengers land and Thanos fighting? caused them to be different. This was not a Doctor Strange film for me, and he got no development, and they didn't build it on his past. I think they just tried to sell you a nice comic adventure story here, and I just think that's a big shame, because the character should be rich enough to give us more than that. I think you're right in the sense that they go back to things that were in the first film that may or may not be relevant now. They 
sort of pick up where the first film left off in the sense of his relationship to Christine and I guess his growth as a sorcerer, the way he's been supplanted in that role. Although we've had limited coverage of who he is in the other films that he's been in, really. He more just fills a role in those films. So in Infinity War, he's the one that rubs up against Stark. It's the two egos battling each other. And Spider-Man No Way Home, he's an antagonist for the first half of the film because he has that different level of morality to Peter Parker, what he's willing to do versus what Peter Parker's willing to do, which does come into play in this film a bit, although it's almost like he relearns that morality lesson in this film that he learned in No Way Home. That's the problem. Because in No Way Home, he learns to see things Peter's way after Peter proves to him, oh, look, we didn't have to send these people back to die. This is actually working. Okay, we broke the universe at the end here. Then again, how much of that lesson does he actually remember because of the end of No Way Home? We don't really know the mechanics of that memory spell that he cast, what he remembers about Because we know he remembers the encounter because he references it in this film. But we don't know what he remembers of the particulars because that lesson will come hand in hand with knowing Peter Parker or knowing about Peter Parker. So who knows? Some explanation is needed on the ending of No Way Home, something me and Chris talk about at length during the No Way Home podcast. What I find interesting about his arc in this film, in a way, is early on, the other doctor sitting next to him at the wedding saying, did you have to make that choice? And he's like, yeah, it was the only way. And he's like, yeah, but my cat's died. So was it the only way? And it sets that up as a question that he can ask himself throughout the film, which I don't think he really asks himself, but... What happens throughout the multiverse is he encounters versions of himself or hears about versions of himself that make really bad choices, that Mm. corrupt themselves. And the suggestion is, is every Doctor Strange like that? Which surprised me, actually, in a multiverse concept that they're leaning into the fact that you are fundamentally the same across all universes. Every version of you is on a basic level the same guy, which is something that Spider-Man, again, taps into a bit even though the two Peter Parkers look different or different ages, on a basic level, they are very similar with some differences. So the gauntlet is laid down for this version of Doctor Strange to make different choices, which he then does at the end when he doesn't take America's power, when the other Strange, Defender Strange, is what he's dubbed because of what he's wearing, does. Although it seems that they all use the dark hold, although this version of Strange did it for more noble reasons... Because there was really no other choice. If he wanted to help America, the only thing he can do is possess the corpse of himself that's in the 616 universe conveniently. Because there is no other way. There's nothing else he could have done there. I thought it was a clever little bit, actually, because I'd forgotten that the corpse was there when I first saw it. So when it comes up again, I thought you had to dreamwalk into a version of yourself living in that universe. And he says, who says it needs to be living? And now, oh, yeah, there's a dead Doctor Strange that they just buried Chekhov's corpse. I guess. Well, exactly. <laughs> that bothers me, though, because it is that stuff that I come across and think it feels like it's not clever enough. I don't know if that's an elitist statement, but it feels like if you're going to do a story which involves digging into the character's past, then I want to see more stuff from their past. I admit that there is a danger in referring back to a previous film that the audience might not have seen because this is a 10-year-old, if not more, story now with all the different films and TV shows. But putting something in the film, something that's completely new in this film, the dead body that he then goes back to, and then at the end, the black spirits come out and said, this is against the rules. What rules? Whose rules? You've just told me it's against the rules right now. That's cheap to just say it's against the rules. How do I know that this is a bad thing that he has done? I mean, it's a bit gross. It's a bit grim. But how do I know that this is a serious violation of the universe? Because you're telling me right now. And that has no emotional impact whatsoever. So I think there's quite a lot in that that I don't really think of as being that clever. It's just another gimmick that was brought in in this film. I would rather have seen more of his past and him processing it, if that's what I'm going to get to at the ending. Because the ending's a bit flat for me, where he says, I was afraid, I'm not any longer. And the implication is the other Stevens must have been still afraid, because that's how they were corrupted. But it's an implication, it's not given. The one who's completely succumbed to the dark hold, you buy it because he's completely succumbed, and fear is a good way to fall. We know that from Star Wars, but I'm having to get that from Star Wars? So what's that going on? But the other one, he defeated Thanos. 
with the Darkhold. And I don't really know what was bad about that, other than a bunch of random cameos telling me he was awful, you know. Was he? What did he do? Oh, he's just terrible. Oh, uh, yeah, fair enough. He was really bad for our world and did bad things to our world. Oh, okay, fair enough. And again, you're just telling me. To be honest, the world which was inherited by the Illuminati seemed all right, actually. Seemed fine. Not much consequence there. And again, you could tell me, oh yeah, they cleaned it up. Okay, but that's not their story. I don't care what they've done. They're just cameos here. I'm interested in seeing Stephen. So I needed to see Stephen in the other two iterations of himself, I think. Now, it's interesting when you bring up that you're effectively the same person in each of them. All right, yeah, fair enough. That actually makes sense, and it gives you something to work with. By the way, it adds a rule to the universe that we now know that we've been shown rather than just told. That's how I want my rules to come in. Nonetheless, even though these people are just the same, you might make small changes that butterfly effect out and then change your life completely. This is such a really interesting idea, and it feels like that's the Doctor Strange story. It feels like that is what this film is about, the paths that he could have chosen, because will you go down the route of the Stephen Strange that sacrificed America, or will you not? I'm hard-pressed to tell you what it was about Stephen in our universe that made him not sacrifice America. It was just not a very nice thing to do, but how did he learn that? What was it that inspired him to do it? Where was his moment where he thought, oh, I'm not going to go down that route because the other me made this choice and this compromise and they lost that, but they gained this. Obviously, you don't want to see that played out in exposition, but your brain, I think, needs to be thinking back to it and going, I totally wouldn't sacrifice her now because of this, that and the other. But at the end of what we were given, I think he just doesn't sacrifice her because we, the audience, know that's a nasty thing to do. That's not clever. I wanted something, especially from Doctor Strange, where his whole character is about being clever. I wanted the script to show me his cleverness, and it just wasn't there for me. Well, he had spent some meaningful time with America. We did see that throughout the film, and I guess that's why he decided differently. Was it meaningful? We'll come back to that. Bring that back. That's a bookmark for me. We will. And we'll come back to the Illuminati because there's things that I've read about that were planned for usage in this film that they didn't do, which you might be interested in. It's not in the film, so it doesn't affect the film. And you're right. No. There's no context to, was that version of Strange using the Dark Hold really that bad a thing? We do see that there are consequences to our Strange using the Dark Hold because he gets his third eye. Although that's probably Ooh, really good. third eye. We don't know what that means, but that's the suggestion of corruption. It is, yeah. And there will be more to that. Maybe it won't go down the same route of the version that gets unceremoniously impaled on a fence. But it could be something that he battles with for the rest of his life. And he's always getting drawn into that darkness. Or the what if Doctor Strange, he went down a really dark path. He didn't read the Darkhold, I don't think. I can't remember the episode well enough. I don't remember them saying that. no. No, but he did have a third eye, didn't he? In that episode. I don't remember even that, if I'm honest. But anyway, I was surprised in a way they didn't use the what if version, but I'm guessing they want to keep that separate because they might use him again and we can't kill him off. The trailer certainly suggested it was going to be that one because he looked enough like him and whatever else. I mean, they all look enough like him because they're all Benedict Cumberbatch, but you know what I mean? He looked in that vein. When you saw the trailer, you're like, oh, okay, it's the what if one. When it's not, it's a different one. But yeah, why was using the Dark Hold to defeat Thanos such a bad thing. Why is it worse than wiping out half the universe for five years? Well, quite. Yeah. Yeah. It does make you think that the this is the only way decision might be a bit of arrogance on Strange's part. I don't want to use the Dark Hold. We'll do this instead. And it will all work out in the end because we'll bring everyone back and that won't create infinite problems. Zombie universe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that, that could have been a thing. I wouldn't have minded seeing that. And I'm saying, yeah, you brought everybody else back as undead. Half the universe is undead now. All right. Do you know what? I agree. That was a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, that Thanos was just killed on Titan, it looks like. So um, didn't even get there. They didn't lose half the universe because Strange used the Dark Hold and then his pals at the Illuminati just stabbed him in the back and decided, nah, can't let you live after this. <laughs> For whatever reason. The Christine through line is quite an interesting one. And I think, in a way, what if prepares you for that? Although it is a different strange, but the whole he 
cares more about her than he lets on. The first film suggests that he's moved on from that relationship when he really hasn't. The 616, Christine's only in that one scene, really. She only appears at once, and the rest of the time he deals with 838 Christine, who challenges him in a more direct way, I suppose. The other one does challenge him, but this one has no airs and graces about it because I guess she's seen the end of that, the end result of his potential corruption. And those couple of references to you have to be the one holding the knife was quite interesting. You have to be the one in charge. You have to be the hero. You have to be the centre of attention. To me, that was just a lie. That was something that sounded good in the script that hailed back to the very first Doctor Strange, his development. But for me, he wasn't somebody anymore that had to be wielding the knife he set up a chain of events that allowed first of all bruce to do a snap and then that carries on into tony stark doing the snap at no point did i ever think of our avengers dr strange stephen strange being the one who was center stage and i thought no that's just lazy that's the original storyline where he had to be the one who showed up his colleagues in the hospital and explicitly said not only am i correcting your mistake but i'm publicly humiliating you before i do it now that was a stephen strange but when you come to avengers and all the stories that come around that at no point is he actively humiliating somebody before he then corrects them. He has a challenge with them. He doesn't necessarily like people. He says to Spider-Man, you're doing the wrong thing here. But at no point does he wield Peter Parker out in front of the school and humiliate Peter to prove that he is the best. That is part of his history. As soon as they start doing that, again, I'm thinking, no, that's lazy. You have not accounted for the development that Stephen has done. You've watched the first film and you've done it from that. Sorry, not clever enough. Okay. I suppose you could extrapolate the arrogance through the Avengers films, as in he knows that he couldn't be the one to do the snap because it would kill him. Maybe he just wants to survive this so he can be the one to gloat. But you don't really see him gloating about how great it was that he saved the universe, which he could have done. And it isn't really in this film, but it's suggested in No Way Home that he's a bit salty about the fact that he isn't the Sorcerer Supreme. And I suppose it is kind of in this film because he refuses to bow to Wong even though it's the custom, and then he does at the end, yes. which is a suggestion that he's learned a bit more humility. He ate a bit of humble pie in the first film, now he's finished it, and he's acknowledged that Wong is the guy in charge. See, now, that was something that I did enjoy, where he does bow to him at the end, and it is where Stephen learns, as you say, a proper humility, that he doesn't need to do that bit. But that, for me, is not the same as needing to wield the knife. That's somebody who hasn't processed his, as you put it in the notes here, the demotion from Sorcerer Supreme. But I don't remember him again trying to humiliate Wong and say, oh, you're an awful Sorcerer Supreme. It was just, no, we're equals, aren't we? I've slid a bit, but we're equals. No, he is the Sorcerer Supreme, so you should show humility to him. And he does at the end. So that was a really nice touch. I just wish that that had been connected to the rest of the film. Yeah, and it pairs up a bit with him not able to admit to his own Christine, but admit to a Christine the feelings that he's sort of been denying. Although it's probably inappropriate to say to a woman at her wedding Mm. (laughs) what your true feelings are. Although the inviting an ex to a wedding, okay, they still get along. They're still colleagues in theory, even though he's not a doctor in the way he was before he became a sorcerer in the first film. But it seems a bit weird that she approaches him at her wedding so they can discuss how their relationship broke down. <laughs> it seems to be a bit of an inappropriate conversation to be having when your husband's off speaking to other guests. It was a bit of a strange exposition point, that one. But, well, since we're here, let's talk about why it's not you walking down the aisle. I think that's another thing, though, for me, where it's because the plot needed it to. The script needed them to have that conversation. And it feels like, Again, to me, maybe there was a cleverer way of bringing that up. Yeah, although it does set up the whole he likes to play God or maybe even sees himself as a God side of thing because he literally turns water into wine in that scene. And this was pointed out to me, I didn't notice it myself, but apparently Sam Raimi would frame him with halos in the background. (laughs) No, I didn't see that. Yeah, I didn't really notice it either time, but it wasn't pointed out to me until I saw it the second time, so... I'll take that person's word for it. But it's an interesting angle to do with because arrogant characters see themselves as godlike 
Doctor Strange could be godlike because he literally has that kind of power. The water into wine thing was something I noticed, definitely, because it was very overt. Yeah, and that's quite fun. Sure, why not? And it's a good way to set up a he thinks he's a bit of a god type arc, but they don't really play with that. It's never really suggested that he is playing god at any point. No, that's the problem. But it's hinted at with the whole, well, you decided that the universe needed to be wiped out for five years. That was his decision. Even that bothers me, though. It really knocks me that people are coming up and challenging us. I'm sorry, in the middle of a fight for the soul of the very universe, somebody had to make a decision, and he did. And if you with your dead cats would like to step up and use the Eye of Agamotto and make a choice, please do. (laughs) Nobody stops you. You could have flown out there if you'd have wanted, and you could have had your say in it. I do get it that he had to make a call. But what knocks me about even that is when you're watching him make that decision and nod to Tony Stark, before he does it, he makes an investigation through as many timelines as he possibly can. Now, if he'd have just made that call in the moment, based on his gut feeling, which is something that American shows love to point out. I made that call. How did you do it? Because my gut told me I don't use 30 years of policing expertise to make a choice. I use my gut. That's a really well-known plot line. But he didn't use his gut. He sat there. He looked through as many timelines as possible and said, I can't quote it, but he said something like, in only one of them do we win of all the ones I saw, and this is how it works. And to me, if you're going to do that much research, In that shorter space of time, go with it. Brilliant. That was the most informed decision anybody could make. And yet he's being told, you love to play God. No, he did his homework. Did anybody else do the homework? Did anybody else look through the mists of time and figure out what was going to work? Anybody got a plan here? Nobody had a plan. They're all desperately fighting Thanos and it wasn't working. So their plan to turn up and slap him across the face had fallen. Right, plan B, anybody? No? Anybody else got anything they want to do? No? Shall I look through time then? Brilliant. Okay. So he puts in all the effort and then gets blasted for it. So for me, again, it comes back to it's another point where the writer ignored what was in a previous film because they thought it would be either cool or easy to go back to something beforehand and overwrite it. The whole setup for Stephen just ignored who he had become and what he had done and put in what the plot force needed for the film that they wanted to make. And to me, it's either lazy or it's arrogant because you know your film is so good, you don't have to worry about a previous plot or it's lazy because you didn't look into it. And here I am judging from the the seat of my living room as if I've made a film. But I think there's enough behind what I've said to suggest that they didn't pay enough attention to Old Strange. They did do what they wanted. So I do feel a bit elitist as I'm sitting here saying it, but I don't think that comes from nowhere. Yeah, no, I agree that there are gaps in what the film was getting at. And I do think that they could have really used what was in here to properly interrogate that, such as the whole, you made this decision. And Strange said, yeah, it was the only way. And that's all he said. So he doesn't really explain himself, or maybe he doesn't feel like he has to, or doesn't feel like any explanation will be accepted as well, because if you're dealing with someone that is that emotionally driven, as this guy was, I lost my cats and whatever, then he's probably not going to listen to you going about, I looked through five million timelines or whatever it is, and there was only one where it was possible to win. And that includes the one where I knocked out Peter Quill so that he didn't stop us from removing Thanos's gauntlet from his hand because yes. that was a key moment that scuppered their plans they were onto something there so you have to wonder how that plays out when someone just yes. knocks out peter quill because presumably something else goes wrong after that point if you do that because that's the way these things work it's the domino effect isn't it the, okay if i change this thing then everything else goes wrong or he just gets a gauntlet back and it only slows him down we only buy ourselves 10 minutes by doing this or whatever. Once we get the gauntlet, then what? That kind of thing. Yeah. So they could have definitely interrogated it more and there was a lot that it suggested. I think this film was more interested in trying to come to some sort of resolution with his relationship with Christine, which it kind of does, but kind of doesn't, as in he never gets any absolution with the original or his own Christine, the one he knows, because she doesn't appear after the wedding scene. So he gets to tell another version of her that isn't her how he feels. 
And that's, I guess, a rare bout of honesty from him. But at the same time, it's having his cake and eating it too, because he doesn't have to deal with what the Christine he knows will say about it. Mm. So it's a bit of a cheat in that respect, but I suppose at least he admits it to himself, which is the main thing. And then he cuts about in his colourful shirt at the end and gets dragged into the dark dimension by Clea, who is a character that nobody will know about unless they've read the comics. But she is, for the avoidance of doubt here. She is Dormammu's niece. I think she's the current Sorcerer Supreme in the comics because I believe that Doctor Strange in the comics is currently dead, which is in comics a bit of a holiday. He'll be back eventually, but she's in that role at the moment. They have a relationship. She's evil. She's not evil. It's that side of things. So if anybody's going to tempt him into embracing the the darkness that is coming through the dark hold, it'll be her, Mm. I suppose. But it's one of those post-credit scenes that leaves you scratching your head because even though I know who the character is, I don't know what they're planning to do with it. They mention an incursion, which is something that came up earlier in the film, where universes smash together and destroy each other. It doesn't really tell you what that is. It doesn't, it doesn't. And they just randomly blame it on Stephen, which is, again, uh, no, don't do that. How did you smash two universes together? What happened? Maybe that's how we get the, the X-Men in the universe. It smashes into another universe and no, the X-Men come with it. Crisis and Infinite Earth style. We all live on the same Earth now. These things are different. Could be... No. There is the rumour that they're building up to secret wars, which is people from across the multiverse coming together on a planet to fight, which could happen. If that's what it is, that sounds a bit weird, but I'm sure it's more than that when you look into it. In the comics, not really. It's not. (laughs) They just turned up for a big party. (laughs) Yeah, it's just, we'll take this character from this universe, there are alternate selves from this universe, we'll make them fight a bit. What's it for? It's to sell comics. That's all it is. Oh, no. They might be building that, they might not. I don't know. There's a lot of things they could be building to in this phase of the MCU. It's difficult to pin down what they're doing. Because it seems like the multiverse was going to be the thing, but this film seems to stick a pin in that in a way. Suggests that we're not really going to do too much with that. We've had our fun in two films with it now, and there's what if that will probably do it. But it doesn't seem like there's a lot of interest in really going nuts with it. There was the point of danger for me, actually. A few times in the last few years when we've talked about this sort of stuff, the one thing I've constantly raised as something that I'm not sure about and don't know if I like is when it goes really nuts. And I know we've been on podcasts with Isaac and he said, I really want that. That's the bit I'm going to love when they go really nuts. But for me, it was always, I think there's a danger point when they go that far, they will start to lose an audience because you'll always keep the comic book audience. You'll always keep the true fan base. But the box office relies on everybody wanting to see this. And I don't know that you can go that deep into things like Multiverse of Madness and the really wacky stuff and expect to keep everybody. You can do it one way. Thor 3 did it by making it funny. And people will have just found it hilarious. At which point, yeah, we're still on board. But if you're trying to do a serious plot... But then everything around you is people turning into paint. You can lose that grounding in reality. Again, those of us that are maybe more into that in our particular subculture will say, no, I'm, I'm happy. My suspension of disbelief is a lot further out than everybody else because I've already embraced comics. But your average audience member won't have done so. And I can't tell, actually, at this point, if Doctor Strange 2 went beyond the pale for me because I couldn't get past its script. Maybe I could track that back at you. Do you reckon this was decidedly weirder and stranger than the rest of it? Or do you reckon this was on a par with things like Thor and the audience would have been carried with it? I don't think it's all that weird at all, because the only weirdness you really get is that one sequence where he's hopping through universities and he becomes animated, he turns into paint, whatever else. It's a very short sequence, and it's one of those... When you get it on Blu-ray or on Disney+, Plus, you can freeze frame it and see where he is and what we're looking at here, what the texture of that universe is. There's dinosaurs and whatever. There's Mm. all that sort of stuff. But I don't think it really leans into it. And that's what I was alluding to when I was talking about expectations. People are going to be expecting that to be the film. As in, Mm. maybe it's a chase through or certainly a journey through multiple universes and we're going to do some weird stuff with it. There's going to be the animated one. There's going to be the dinosaur one, etc. So they're going to or people were expecting them to do that, or we're going to hop through all the previous dead Marvel universes that they made films out of that now are defunct. This stuff that we got from Fox, so we'll go visit the X-Men universe, we'll go visit the Daredevil universe, we'll go visit whatever. And again, we didn't get that. It's like we discussed during Moon Knight, 
that the MCU will push things in a certain direction, but they will never go too far. And they'll never go to the point that you were talking about where they potentially completely lose a chunk of the audience. There'll be things that people will like or don't like. So you didn't like this film, but that doesn't mean you're not going to watch Thor Love and Thunder in a couple of months. True. And whatever else they decide to make, it doesn't mean you're not going to watch She-Hulk or Ms. Marvel or any of the other Disney Plus shows. It's just you didn't like this one. But there'll be plenty of variety out there for you to sink your teeth into. You've already expressed that you're really interested in what they're going to do with Blade and Black Knight and all the weird, supernatural, possibly a bit darker stuff. And I don't think they'll go too dark with those things. I think it'll be a fairly family-friendly Blade by comparison, I don't think it'll be the proper Wesley Snipes. Wesley Snipes is comic booky as well, but mm. really grim and violent in places. I don't think it's going to be that. I think it's going to be more yeah. measured. It's not even going to be like it was in the Netflix stuff. It's not going to be as brutal as that. So anybody that's expecting this Daredevil show that they've announced to be like the Netflix show was, is probably going to be disappointed mm. because they're probably going to take it in a different direction where you don't have Fisk slamming someone's head in a car door or whatever else. They might allude to things like that, but they won't do it. That's what I think. And it sounds like I'm insulting the MCU by saying that, but I'm not. I'm just aware of what the setup is and that they know what they're doing in terms of, let's push the boat out and let's do it gradually. Because like I said, during Moon Knight, they've been trickling in different elements. They've actually been very deliberate with the multiverse. They've introduced it very slowly and in very easy to digest ways. Spider-Man, you can understand that there's two other Spider-Men that you can talk to. In this, you get the sense of, this is how weird the multiverse can get, but we'll take you to a similar-ish universe to this one. The sky is a bit rainbow-coloured and there's plants on the side of buildings, but don't worry, you're not going to be too weirded out by any of this. And maybe eventually they'll let you sink into that and they'll do a film set in the paint universe. I don't know. I don't know. I want to see that. Maybe I do. Maybe I don't. Maybe it's a sequence in it. I don't know. So, no, I don't think that they'll alienate large chunks of the audience it will be some people will like this some people won't and we'll move on and that's what you'll do i think yeah i'm picking up from what you're saying that there's a certain logic to the idea of you'll go into the corner of the room that you now want to be in it's like a big party of films and all the films have come into the living room and you'll just gravitate to the side of the room that you like and you might not like all of them anymore and that's fair, given how many of them there are now. Yeah. But you'll probably still watch everything and give it a go. I will, yeah. But I can imagine, actually, that not everybody will watch everything. And because there's so much of it, though, actually, that won't be a horrendous thing. Yeah. Well, really wanted Angus for this, because he hasn't seen WandaVision. And that would be a great perspective to get, because we have seen it, so we can only speculate as to how people that haven't seen WandaVision will react to it. Yeah. And we'll probably come back to Stephen Strange as we go, because it is his film. But let's move on to Wanda. You could argue that this is her film in some ways, or that it's a high-budget extended finale for WandaVision. You could argue those things. I'm not sure that's necessarily true. It is Stephen's film, but she is the clear antagonist. Yeah. What did you think of the usage of Wanda in this film? I'll now try and repeat the thing I said as we came out of the cinema after having watched it. I thought that was a terrible film, but with potentially the MC used best villain takedown ever. I do need to be specific about that, though, because I think she was potentially the MCU's best villain, but poorly used. And in fact, the best part of her entire film is the ending when she is effectively defeated by the reaction of her two children. That is just amazing. That's the best villain defeat that MCU will ever give us but it was tacked on the end of a terrible treatment of their best villain who didn't really get to be the best villain. She's probably not suffering as much from what I've just accused them of, Stephen. So to be fair, I don't know that they really overwrote her past. I'm committed to that. I stand by it with Stephen. They ignored his past. With Wanda, I think they actually did use her past. And you say it follows directly on from WandaVision. It could have been the film that ends the series or we can't get another series we'll end it with a film so i'm not saying i didn't like what they did with her because of that i think they did well with her character but again her plot it didn't seem to go anywhere good because i don't think they knew what to do with her because they couldn't commit to her power level because it was too high and they only really had one thing 
to aim at with the main villain of her trying to get her children, but the plot specifically ignores the rational arguments against her until later on. They don't forget them. They do bring them up. What about the other you? What about your children being horrified about what you've done to the other you? So they do bring it in. But to me, somebody as clever as Stephen should have immediately said that. But he has to not say, what about the other you? What about your children? Until halfway through the film, because the plot force needs him not to. I would have rather have had him be intelligent right from the start and then have a truly committed wonder come in and say, I don't care. I want what I want. And you realize the dark hold has actually managed to remove her humanity. So she doesn't really think about it. And you could have her go quite cult leader with it, actually, because when you challenge her with, do you not think your children are going to be a bit upset by this? And she comes up with some rationalization as to why, no, they'll love me for saving them from the terrible universe that you idiots have created. I need to bring them into my universe because mine's better. And all of us in the audience will be going, well, that's demonstrably false. But I can see that you're totally insane. And I would not say that to your face because of what you can do to me. Run away. And then you still have the run away part because quite frankly, nobody can take her. But as soon as I knew the plot was purposely holding back good arguments for the action, again, I was thinking it could have been cleverer. You've got an amazing villain here. This is the perfect villain. She is somebody who has been a hero but never quite managed to make her peace with even being a hero, and then suffered infinite despair and pain to the point where she completely crashes out and becomes a villain. Brilliant backstory. Name me an actual villain that went through that kind of development. And of course, because they've not had enough screen time to do so. So should have been the best thing ever, but actually... The best thing ever was her meeting her kids at the end. And I don't think that they built up to that anywhere near well enough. Okay, yeah. I do feel like they missed a step between WandaVision and this. How do you go from Mm. the way that show ended to I'm going to steal someone else's children because that's what it is. They aren't her children. They are another Wanda's children. Although the fact that she managed to create them suggests that she had some kind of awareness of the multiverse, at least on a subconscious level. You have to wonder, the 838, because that's the only other Wanda you see, her children, who is their father? (laughs) Was it still Vision in that universe? It could have been. I don't know that it actually necessarily matters, because in the normal scheme of things, he wasn't involved, as you might expect, so they don't need that. His influence is through nurture would have still been there and arguably they seemed like the same kids so the implication is he is still there but they could have done anything with that he was still there but they lost him early he was still there but he's off shopping and i suppose you didn't need to see him because he wasn't critical to the plot yeah i don't know i don't know who he was but i could easily just say that he was the father and he just wasn't there yeah and then there's a question around why doesn't she want vision back along with her children. She mentions him when talking about that he had his theories about the multiverse, but she doesn't seem all that interested in getting him back because she doesn't mention him after that point, which stood out to me. I was a bit confused as to, you can have anything you want in theory from the multiverse, why not just have your whole family back? Yeah, well, I think this is the whole thing about they didn't lead up to it well enough. The plot meant that they didn't want that extra character in there because it was too much to get in. Therefore, the plot force needs to get rid of that character. And so it is not there. Why is it not there? Because the plot force needs it, darling. Immediately, I'm against you and hate everything you're doing, if you're saying that to me as a writer. But I understand that it was too complicated, too much. Maybe they couldn't get the actor and, okay, fair enough. But there surely seems to be a cleverer way of writing that. Because if you actually have a point like the orchard scene where the two main characters are talking to each other, then you can reveal Wanda's madness. Have you not thought how Vision would think of this, Wanda? And you can see this moment where her brain just jerks to the side and that tiny little part of her conscience is saying to her, oh, yeah, that's something I should think about. And she's starting to crack. But then you have another event that just knocks her straight back online. And it could be the voice of the Darkhold itself. And again, given to you in the plot, You've got the fact that it is definitely the dark hold. The dark hold is dragging her back to madness. So why is she giving up on vision? 
because of the evils of the dark god that is now powering her. That's a perfectly fine explanation. She is effectively hypnotized by the power of this evil, but they don't bother with any of this. I would have loved to have had more conversations between her and Strange to give some of this stuff. And it worked as it was. It was actually a good conversation that they had in the orchard. The bit that they give you in the trailers, you break the universe and everybody thinks you're a hero. I do it and I'm the villain. That doesn't seem very fair. That is a great line. There is no wonder the marketing people said, capture it, (laughs) put it out, because it's one of the best things they had to sell. And I think there should have been more conversations like that because people cannot fight her power level. I mean, it turns out that apparently Captain Carter can. Okay, fair enough. Let's come back to that later. (laughs) That's just rubbish. But at all points, because they shouldn't have been able to fight her power level, she should have been effectively superwoman, whereby we just can't take you. But you know what we can do? We can appeal to your humanity at every stage. And it always seems like we're about to get through, but we keep failing. And so it's this series of conversations coming up. It doesn't mean you have to get rid of your action scenes, but it should mean that somebody like a Captain America or Captain Britain, if that's who she was, whose whole character is built on the strength of your heart being more important than the strength of your body, that character is perfectly set up to say, wonder. I put my shield down. I put my weapon down. I just want to talk. Let's talk about the strength of heart and what you're missing out on here. Let me bring up your children. And eventually she snaps and then she kills Captain Britain and it doesn't quite work. But those conversations were just the whole point of Wanda's character. And they just don't go anywhere at all. Everything you said, I think it could have been in those and they just rob us of it for some pretty naff action scenes sometimes. They're not all naff. I admit that some of the horror ones are not all naff. But some of the points are just, oh, beam of red power. Whee! Yeah, I'm not interested. Just, no, sorry. That's always the problem with magic, isn't it? Is establishing how it works. It's, I've got this spell. Well, I have this counter spell. And we keep doing that until someone wins. <laughs> Which is great, as you say. That's why you get the emotional takedown rather than Doctor Strange just knows a spell. Which would be yes. really crap. But yeah, I think there's more they could have done with Wanda. And I do wonder if people haven't seen WandaVision, whether they're able to follow this. I do think it gives you enough in terms of the emotional grounding because you get the, just like Strange is introduced with a dream, she's introduced with a dream. She's dreaming about her children in another universe. And by this point, you know that dreams come from another universe because the film has told you this by this point. So you see her dreaming about having a pretty mundane yet endearing afternoon with her children where they're baking cakes and the kids are stealing the chocolate out of the bowl and stuff. And then she wakes up and she's totally alone. That's a really gut-punching moment. I think that works really well. So even if you haven't seen WandaVision, you're probably going to be affected by that because of the way it delivers it, even if you don't have the context. Because if you haven't seen WandaVision, if the last time you saw Wanda was in Endgame, where, where are these kids coming from? She killed Vision in the last film which is a bit of a shame, obviously, for her. But she seemed to be moving on with that a little bit, as in she had that conversation with Clint by the lake. Let's bring Clint in. Maybe he can get through to her, actually. Yeah. Strange does dismiss the archer of the Mohawk, but he's maybe the guy that could have actually talked some sense into her because they had that connection. Maybe not dismiss Clint so readily because maybe a few days on the farm is what she needs. Well, it seems to work for everybody else. <laughs> Chop some wood with your magic chaos power for a bit. Yeah, did anyone consider that? <laughs> and then there was that facade in the orchard where these seem real. They are, and they're not. And you've got this really bleak-looking, destroyed area around her. Yeah. That was, again, another effective reveal. And the reveal that she was the villain was nicely done as well. Bring America here. You didn't tell me her name, did you? It's like, nope. And then at that point, they knew what they were in for. Yeah, I'm okay with that, actually. That worked well enough for me. Somebody who is highly emotional, even if they're clever, can make a simple mistake like that. We've all done it. We've all said something in the moment and thought, oh, damn. (laughs) So that was okay. But the bit about that whole scene that does knock me is, in fact, to be fair, I think it was something you said. The line is great. If I do it, everybody thinks I'm the villain. That seems a bit unfair. But when it comes down to it, 
he's literally turned up and said, no, nah, don't worry. Screw with towns as much as you like. No, don't, nah, don't worry about that. It's all forgiven. So she's saying, I'm treated as the villain. No, you're not. You haven't been treated as a villain at all. You're fine. Nobody's coming for you. Everybody thinks you're amazing. And it's another example of, can we move on? Because he should have said something. He should have said, let's talk, because quite frankly, nobody else can have this conversation with you. And he could have been nice about it. I understand the dangers of magic and where it's gotten to you. Let's sit down and have a chat. And it could have been how they revealed it. In the middle of this innocent conversation, it all seems like he's about to persuade her to come back and repent for what she's done and make things better. And she says, oh, well, do you know what? Whilst I'm doing this and I'm making the world better, how about I help you with your problem? Oh, yeah, I've got this problem going on. Big reveal line. Oops. So, again, it's just so annoying that they could have gotten to the same thing without stomping all over the past. And I don't think they needed to give you any more of one division than you've talked about already being in this film with the children, because we're expected to just deal with it as it is with him turning up and saying, yeah, don't worry about flattening that village's emotional situation. I think I'm just going to keep coming back to this. Not clever enough. Although this is the same guy that seems to think casting a spell that makes a guy punch himself in the face for three weeks is fine. That's normal behaviour. Don't even go there. Again, the plot force needed it. The director needed to get a gag in that fitted with his Evil Dead films. I've not seen Evil Dead, but I know the demon hand thing. Wonderful. Yep. You wanted to get your joke in and you thought it was good to compromise the character to do so. Thanks for that. That just makes me think that you as the director think you're better than everybody else because your joke is more important than the film you're in. Elitist as I've been sounding so far, even to myself, I'm standing by that (laughs) one. If your director has to compromise the film to make their thing work, nope, sorry, you're not that good. Don't care who you are. Going back to Wanda and her campaign, I suppose we can call it, that's what it was. Hmm. I think they could have done more with it, but I was okay with the idea of her being her version of reasonable to begin with. As in, I'm not going to throw my entire power set at you. I'm going to do enough to scare you into doing what I want. So the whole camertage battle. I liked the little callbacks to her mind manipulation, which we haven't really seen much of since, other than, of course, WandaVision, which is entirely mind manipulation. But in the same way that she did it in Age of Ultron, as in she waves her hands at someone's head and whispers something in their ear and then they do something. And it was finding the weak link among all the sorcerers. You run and then that breaks the shield. I thought that was all really good stuff. I thought the way that that action scene built and then her crawling out of the mirror, which is your Sam Raimi horror side of it. In Strange Technology, she was being reasonable and now she isn't. So that's when they're on the run and that's when she starts killing and things like that. And She does seem to die at the end of this film. I don't think she does. I think they'll find some way of bringing her back because, again, in comics, death is a holiday. Yeah, you don't see a body. Really. Yeah. yeah, she gets crushed, but she can make a shield. She was doing it earlier. She managed to survive being crushed by tons of water weight wise it's pretty much the same isn't it so she'll probably be fine but it's the can she be redeemed from this question that you need to ask yourself i guess because she does kill a lot of people well that would be an interesting plot line that i'd be okay with because it's essentially the doctor strange plot line can he come back from what is being now for some reason marked as a bad choice an evil choice he shouldn't do that and in the film We see him at one point sacrifice America. So he has to come back from that, even though it wasn't him that did it, it was somebody else. But with Wanda, they could do it to a greater degree. And that would be a film. Yeah, that would be good to watch. Yeah, she can use her powers in different ways and try to do good or Mm. just mess up in different ways. And suffer people not accepting it as ever being good enough. Yeah. It's a reasonably well-known plot line of people coming out of jail and not being able to make up for it, but too bad. Yeah. You don't get to unwind. You don't get a second chance, or however many chances it is. All they've done with Wanda since they introduced her, actually, is pile tragedy on her, because her brother dies in her first appearance. She has to rip the infinite stone out of Vision's head, and it ends up being worthless. Oh, absolutely brutal. It doesn't accomplish anything. Oh, yeah. Undoubtedly the best villain setup we have ever seen. Absolutely. Yeah, and then the one division thing happens, and she does get framed as a villain in that, but she gets, again, framed through the tragedy. One of the final things you see is when she's dismantling the hex, and she says goodbye to Vision and the kids. So there's that bit of sympathy. And then everybody just lets her leave because... There's nothing we can do. Oh, no, quite. There's absolutely no way we can find any form of justice for what you've done. You just have to leave. For some reason, Doctor Strange isn't picking up the phone to come and deal with this. So you just have to leave. 
And that's what she does. And then she goes off and starts reading the dark holes and becomes more and more corrupted. So there's this middle it's point. Descent. There's a descent into madness and then there's a descent into evil from there. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. And she remains sympathetic throughout it as well because you've seen what she goes through. You've seen what she wants. Oh, she doesn't recover from that. There is no way back. Once she starts falling, she goes into free fall. And anybody looking at it goes, and I completely understand why that's happened to you. Yeah. And I keep joking about maybe Clint could get involved, but he should really, because yeah. they established that the two of them have that connection. He's the one that gives her the, you can either stay in this room and cower here, or you can come out and fight. And if you come out and fight, you're an Avenger, you're one of us. And then Ooh. later on in Endgame, they're standing by the light together talking about what they've lost. I brought this up during the One Division podcast as well. Where is Clint? Maybe he should be here. Maybe he should be speaking to her. Maybe he should have yeah. taken her back to the farm for a few days. Seriously, he should have done that because she has nobody after Endgame. Right. So what's she supposed to do? Yeah, and he's also got on his own TV series a proven track record of bringing villains down with emotional discussions. So brilliant. Yeah. His CV is perfect. Everybody's saying, how on earth does he manage to play in the playground that involves all of these really, really powerful people, it does it with the Superman problem. How do you manage to defeat Superman? Well, you use an emotional setup. How do you manage to get through to the evil Superman? You bring out Lois Lane, and it immediately works. Slightly different connection, but it's the same principle. Yeah. You just avoid the power level entirely. Yep, he was right there. So are we saying this is Hawkeye's fault? Is that what we're saying? Oh, no, dear God, no. This is the person who's got control of the plot force. There is a villain out there, by the way, whose superpower is to control plots. And he is the ultimate multiverse villain. And he is the direct opposite. And he is the antagonist for the Watcher. When the Watcher has to go up against somebody, it shouldn't have been Ultron. It should have been the guy who controls the plot force. It's just a terrible thing, but it's always there. You're almost referencing this comic book run where Deadpool goes on a killing spree, which includes him jumping out into the world where the people are writing the comics and murdering the people that write the comics. Nice. Right, get me Deadpool. I need him. <laughs> I need to hire him right now. Well, he was supposed to be in this film at one point, or it was talked about at the very least. Don't know what he would have done. <laughs> well, Told Wanda to calm down before she ripped him at pieces. I don't know. Well, yeah. Could have been anything. Yeah, I'm not saying it's Hawkeye's fault, but I do think that there is a missing beat there where he isn't mentioned or involved because he's the only one that has a connection to her that goes back a ways, but is still alive. But all of this is a perfect example of, again, to talk about that plot force a bit further, how is she compromised? She's not compromised by the loss of her history. She's compromised by a plot that couldn't hold her within it and i think it's worth bringing back up her power level in this because she's being reasonable you say this is why you didn't do this that and the other and this is why she now is going harder at us if that was true then she should have used straight away her powers at camotage to just whisper to a whole bunch of people at once if she's that powerful and she wants to be nice about it then she can actually just get them all to run and we know she's that powerful because we've seen it throughout the film so she doesn't because they want an action scene you don't want that then you shouldn't give somebody that much power beforehand you need something to say that their power is building She's becoming more evil and she's becoming more powerful with it later on. And I've already referenced the point with the pointless cameo team. Just, no, right. I use infinite power to kill one of you with a word or a common joke, almost a pun. And I kill another one of you by looking at you and waving my fingers so you unthread. I'm now going to fight the other two of you, even though this is a really urgent situation where I want to get to my children straight away. I am going to stop and have a normal fist fight with two of you. I have to drop a statue on one of you to make it. And the other one, who's got no power at all, I have a massively long fight with you. The power level that she has, she should have done a Thanos and clicked her fingers and got rid of all three of them. Or she should have said four different things. Should have been, what mouth? Unravel you like knitting. And two other things equally as fast to just walk through them. And then she's scary because she does just walk through them. This film, for me, the horror was not horrifying. There was no horror in this for me. It was slightly horrifying. And I admit that I'm older than some of the audience would have been. So if you're a bit younger and you've not seen horror before, then some of it is going to be a bit nasty. But the horror for me would have been with the Illuminati. 
we're better than all of you. We're powerful and strong and amazing. And we got rid of Doctor Strange, even though he'd got the power of the Darkhold. And when they arrogantly say, oh, that little girl with her red power, she is no threat to us. Okay, if you're going to be that arrogant, then I want to see the payoff. And you give it with two of you. But to be fair, when they said Scarlet Witch is nothing to us, they're almost right. Because the two, I've forgotten what the other one is now, the two female Illuminati, one of them's Captain Carter and the other Captain one Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel. Those two, it looked like they could deal with the Scarlet Witch. How does that work? What power did they have to resist her? Maybe Captain Marvel can resist being undone like a ball of string, I suppose. Her atoms are closer together. Or <laughs> Captain Carter, no. And then the bit that really just had me head in my hands almost. We need to get into the sewer with the water, and we have shut a door on her. And there's this boom, boom on the door or something. Yep, she's been stopped by a door. She killed this Black Bolt guy. Everybody else around him is saying, he's so powerful. You think we're strong? Look at this Black Bolt guy. He's just even more powerful than us. But she just got rid of him with a simple click of the hand. And yet the door, oh, that really puts power down to the door. Can't get through a door. Just for a crappy little jump scare where it turns out she went round two corners and appeared the other side of the door. That was just stupid. And then they drop water on her. She should have just said, oh, it's raining in here. And this flood of water just turns to a small misty trickle. None of it made any sense. So the whole thing, I thought, compromised her power level. I admit because it had to, because they've given her that much power. But if you don't want to deal with it, surely the better answer is not to give her that much power. Yeah, I wouldn't say it was an especially strong example of horror. It was horror themed. And I think some of it was quite tense. You had the slasher movie villain thing of she's just walking slowly towards them, that kind of stuff. Oh, but don't get me started. Why is she walking slowly towards them? She can fly. Well, there's things on the ground that will break her feet. So blow like Superman and throw the glass away. Snap your fingers and turn the glass into sand. They had to slow her down to turn her into a zombie. It's coming for you. Just daft that she could have been held up by some broken glass. Oh, I'm getting angry. I'm (laughs) feeling the rage. I'm actually feeling the rage. I want to be Moonlight, but maybe I am. (laughs) Well, Moon Knight can be an angry man. Right, that's fine then. I'll channel a bit of Jake. That'll do me. I'm ready for that personality. Mark's a bit angry sometimes. Yeah. Right, give me some anger. Oh, I'm feeling it. Stephen's coming back. Oh, I feel better now. That's good. Let's move on then. There is a reading of the film that I put in the notes that I've seen around a couple of times on various things that Wanda is done a disservice by being characterised as your stereotypical mad woman, which is a trope that turns up in loads of things, as in, this woman is insane and we need a man to calm her down. And the reading of this, or it's our reading of this, I don't think it's quite as simple as that, although I definitely see where it comes from. So do you think that's a fair reading? Do you think that Wanda is relegated to just that? I would say she is not relegated to just that because her motivation, as we've seen it, arguably if you haven't seen all of her back plot, as we've seen it, is stronger than that. And it's very reasonable based on everything we've described of our vision and her kids and her brother and the whole meaningless of it all. I don't think she is ever shown to be in any way a woman who is mad I think she is shown to be a character who has justifiably lost it and then been taken over by a dark god. So, no, I never at any point felt she had been reduced to something. However, I do acknowledge that I've seen her full back plot with her brother, with everything else that comes with all of the previous films and TV shows. So... Did this film give you enough to avoid that? No, actually. But I'm not sure that that's a problem of the character. And weirdly, am I about to defend the writing? How mad is that? I don't think it's necessarily a problem with this writing. I think it's a problem of anybody that's expecting to just watch a Marvel film now and not do their homework and see the rest of it is kidding themselves. I don't think you can treat any of these as standalone films. Some of them are easier to watch as standalone films than others. Maybe the Spider-Man No Way Home was easier to treat with. And perhaps I could come back to, well, it needs to be clever enough. They need to be standalone films 
so you don't have to do your homework. And I normally argue against having to do your homework. I appreciate the irony of that, but it's just, it's been 10 years or more. How many years has it been now? 12? I, mean, I can't even remember. It's 14, 15 years. Iron Man came out in 2008. Right. Okay. Well, there you go then. It's been 14 years. The idea that you should be able to just judge one of these Marvel films by themselves, I think is just asking too much. So I can see it from that one point of view, but I think that's unfair. I think by and large the Marvel films do work on their own merits, but you do have to, if you haven't seen the previous iterations that some of these characters appear in, you do have to be prepared to just go with what they're giving you. I've mentioned that before, you pick up a comic book arc that has guest characters in it, you don't know who those guest characters are. You just have to go with what they're up to and where they've come from and what they're talking about that they're missing because they're here doing this, that kind of stuff. Mm. And there is a bit of a suspension of expectation in a way with that because you don't want this thing to be wasting time telling you the intricate backstory. You don't want the first half hour of this film to essentially be a crib notes version of one division just so you know what's going on. And I think it's a valid criticism that people say that maybe this is inaccessible because they haven't seen one division. But at the same time, do you want a shared universe or don't you? Because if you want a shared universe that doesn't hold your hand, that is interconnected, then you have to accept that it's not going to hold your hand and make sure that you know everything before you go in. So that's what you accept. That's what you have to accept. Otherwise, it can't be a shared universe. Otherwise, it's just a, well, it is a shared universe, but it also has reams of exposition to make sure everybody's exactly caught up. We talked, well, we haven't really talked about the Avengers in total, which is an episode we should do one day, but that film does a great job of making sure you know everything you need to know before the film starts. In fact, the first act is about, here's who these people are and here's why we're bringing them together. But it does it in such a neat way that you don't notice that it's doing that. Whereas this just essentially assumes that you've seen WandaVision and expects you to just put up with it. Yeah, well, maybe I can come back to then. The film isn't clever enough and could have done more. It's difficult for us to say because we have the perspective of, well, we've seen everything, so we don't want to have this explained to us again because we watched it. And, yeah, you don't want your film to start with previously on WandaVision or whatever, every time. (laughs) Those that are familiar with the Marvel Cinematic Universe just don't come in for the first 20 minutes because that's all it is. It's a clip show of previous things to make sure. This is a double feature, one with the homework and one with the action. <laughs> so I get where people are coming from in that respect, but at the same time, you either have your shared universe or you don't. And if you don't want that, then I think you need a different thing, I suppose. Yeah, it's one of those things. It's like a conceit. Buy into it or walk away. Yeah, and I agree. I don't think that she is entirely the stereotypical mad woman trope. But I do see where that comes from. And mm. we're coming at it from the perspective of being men that have watched things that focus on men solving problems for such a long time because representation has been in the gutter for so long. So we can't really come at it from the perspective of, well, what would a female viewer think of this in her portrayal? Well, I do understand that argument, but if we are human beings, then we are expected to show empathy, which we claim we do have. And whereas I can't appreciate the life that's gone before that gives you that perspective in that detail, I am required as a older white male in this environment, to at least attempt to show empathy and not just say, it's beyond me. I'll just leave it to you guys now because I'm not capable. To me, that's a poor excuse. I have to be able to say, nope, I can't do this quickly. I can't do this immediately. But if I sit down and actually put some effort into this and think about it, then I should be able to get to that viewpoint through my human empathy. And to be fair, I honestly believe having sat down and thought about it a bit, that Wanda has not been treated badly because we have seen the horror of her life build through it. I think she is a person that's become mad, not just a woman being used as a trope. So I appreciate what you're saying, but I think we are required to use our empathy and using my empathy. I am still saying, nope, I think this character was done well with overall in that sense, even if this film wasn't clever enough to prove it to us. Yeah, and the whole thing about representation, we talked about it during Moon Knight. It's weird. We spent a lot of time on Moon Knight talking about Doctor Strange and a lot of time on this talking about Moon Knight. But I think there is connections to be drawn there because it is the magical side of things. And there's one thing to bring up about the rules, which I will come back to. I meant to when you mentioned it earlier, but I'll 
look back to it somewhere. I'll, yeah. I'll make it happen. Stay tuned. Set up a, here's a conversation we'll have in a few minutes. And there's an argument for the whole, we've got a female character here. What does she want? Children. That's the most basic goal that a female character could have in any of these things. But again, as you said, we have the context of why she wants her children. Yeah. You do have a few hammy lines about I'm a mother and whatever else that are a bit grating to listen to, to be honest. Sure. Script not clever enough. Happy to say that, yeah. They're not real children. You conjured them up magically. Isn't that what every mother does? No, that's not what every mother does. That's what you did. Yeah. There was a few of those throughout that made me roll my eyes a little bit. I'm a mother. You are, I suppose. It's the whole problem that people are talking about when somebody's taking something at face value and not digging into any details or nuance then you've probably hit a trope as soon as some writer just says i'm a mother and then walks away and expects you to take everything you need from that no you shouldn't do that yeah and people pointed out the acronym the multiverse of madness mom (laughs) it's something that you can draw to yeah okay that's in the title kind of there's a multiverse and there's madness and mom mother reaching a little bit i guess Danger, danger, yeah. Yeah, so Wanda's takedown, as you said, it was very strong, and I really like that emotional payoff of, I'm going to give you what you want, but what you want doesn't want you. By the way, talking of characters who have just been treated awfully, you're about to bring up the one that was treated the worst, so yeah, carry on. We'll get to her, but Wanda's takedown actually is reminiscent of another Sam Raimi movie, Spider-Man 2, because that's kind of how Doctor... Octopus is taken down as and he comes to his senses. Peter points to the machine that's about to wipe out the city and says, this is your fault. Look at what you've done here. And he says, yeah, this is my fault. I have to solve this problem. And it's even where well, he drowns himself, but he tears something down to do it. So there is a similarity there, but this is a bit more of an emotional payoff there. But I really like that scene where the kids were terrified, her other self was terrified. Yeah, that was the best part of the whole film. It was very good. And then she gets crushed and that's the end of it. Or is it? Let's not linger on the good stuff for too long. We'll just put it in as a teaser. This is what you... <laughs> I thought it was really effectively done and quite moving as well, the way that she literally looks in the mirror. She sees herself, she sees what she could be and sees what she's so corrupted away from. And then there is no choice for her other than to put a stop to this once and for all. Should have been moving, totally wasn't moved by it at all. At the end, I felt robbed because that really excellent ending should have been the culmination of two hours of watching and it should have been so upsetting but it wasn't because it was just given to me as a flick of a switch at the very end and i appreciated it intellectually yep that's a good choice for a story i wish you'd written it yeah she destroys the dark hold in every universe which is quite a feat i must say the should tear down the mountain in every universe as well let's just not think about that is this where the original one was trans i don't know it doesn't really explain it but it's fine she makes it so that nobody can fall into this trap again i suppose yeah. which is a catharsis in a way but it was much more effective when it was just my children or these children are terrified of me and she's been woken up enough to realize well these children will be terrified of me but maybe the ones in 837 won't be let's give them a go well yeah drag it out and make it painful <laughs> Yeah, but you want to talk about America now, not the country, the character, America Chavez. Well, I think that is the woman who did get treated badly because the poor thing has absolutely no character development. She's expected to come in and say that she's part of a diverse family, so she's being used as a banner. And it's not a banner that gets developed in any way or has any meaning. It's literally just, let's paint this. And I think if it had been more like some previous shows we've talked about whereby you have your diversity so here we come back to moon Knight, and it's just in the background and it it's used well without being just pushed into your face in the foreground then great it shows a real acceptance that we have ditched all previous bigotries and problems obviously we haven't but that's what we're moving towards whereas this is just what can we do to make america interesting i know We'll give her two mothers. That'll be good, won't it? Maybe. But given that you didn't develop the character at all, you've now got a situation where that's all she is. She's just somebody to come on and be diverse. 
And she was supposed to be more than that. Oh, let me have a meaningful moment where I look back in time at the flowers and the bees that scared me. Okay, do something with that. Nope, that's just it. That's just the reason you're doing this. Okay, so that was meaningless. How about you give her some reason to be there and give her some sort of character arc to go through? Oh no, she effectively could have just been another book. Because she could have been. She should have just been another book under Stephen's arm. She doesn't do anything that another magical item couldn't have done doesn't learn any lessons, doesn't get to make any decisions. She just goes where she's told. And at the end, I'm going to give you what you want. Why? Why would you do that? Why would you just give the massively powerful person access to her children? Tell me what part of that whole script said to you that her kids were definitely going to react that way. It makes sense to us looking on it intellectually, her kids would be scared. But why does America know in that instance that that's going to work? Equally, how dare you just put two kids in danger? What if this woman goes totally nuts and kills both of them? I'll give you what you want. Brilliant. Oh, they don't like me. Well, I'll just kill those two kids and go and get two other kids from some other dimension. She's under the control of a dark god. You don't know she's not just going to sacrifice them. So she is just a device. It's the terrible treatment of a character to just use her as a device. She's either an exposition tool or she's a magical item that can just be trapped and used by the other characters. And she doesn't even get a good power set. She's got this out of control power that forces her to cross between universes. But conveniently, at the the end of the film, she gets to get all that power into her fist to do a punch. What? Why has she suddenly got physical powers and can beat people up? Oh, because she's a strong woman, so she can hit people. Oh, I've got you. Awful treatment of a character. Yeah, and it's a shame because what you saw of her was good. She had a good dynamic with Strange. The backstory, while being pretty typical, was interesting enough. Of course, it doesn't have any resolution in this film because she doesn't find her mother's. So why is it there? If she's not going to do it in this film, it's a bit of a strange one. Because usually you can't introduce something like that without doing something with it, especially when the whole theme is about finding your family or lost families. There's themes around that that they can play with. Dealing with your past. In theory, that's a way she can relate to Wanda as well, because I lost my parents. You lost your children, but here's me living life and just dealing with it because I don't think I can get them back. Well, that's what I was expecting, actually. I was honestly expecting her to be essentially the Hawkeye that you've described. I have no power. I've got no way to fight you. I could potentially blip into another universe, but quite frankly, that's what you want anyway. So I can't even use the one thing. Even if I got control of it, I can't really do anything good with it. So do you know what I am going to do? I'm going to use my experience of regretting the actions of your past and struggling to come and deal with it. And that would have even made some sense based on the trope character that she was given, because she was pretty much just another Buffy. She comes along, she's a bit sassy, and she apparently knows more than all of the adults around her because she's that smart, because she's a plucky young woman. And you just think, okay, fine, it's a trope character. I've seen it many times before. But if you're going to use it, And she does have a wisdom beyond her years because she's suffered throughout all these universes. Then do you know what? That would actually redeem it because you're going to give it some value. So she's going to have the conversation at the end with Wanda and talk her down. All right. I'm up for that. I can see that happening. I'm sitting there in the cinema. Nope. Don't even get to do that. You just get fist power in the end and you just punch somebody for also really stupid reasons. Oh, I'm going to get angry again. <laughs> Give me something to bring Stephen back. Well, she was an object in the sense that, yeah, she's the thing that everybody wants or that Wanda wants anyway. Stephen doesn't really want her. He mm. just has to protect her. And I guess he's motivated to protect her more than he would be a book because she's a person. Yeah. It doesn't really matter if someone rips up a book. It doesn't matter. A lot of this film is the quest for a different book, and then as soon as they find it, it gets destroyed. So, waste of time <laughs> for everyone concerned. But then it's the, this book has what you need, so I would have really hated it if that book had been any use whatsoever, because here's the book that can solve the problem. Let's destroy the book. The only problem it can't solve is yeah. someone burning it, apparently. It's not protected against... Where was this book before, though, by the way? Somebody's about to blip half the universe. Do you know what we need? We need the book that would actually solve the problem of the Sorcerer Supreme's worst enemy. Uh Uh-huh. This counts. 
that was at the right <laughs> level, universe ending power. Nope, we just need to create something in the film to purposely destroy it. It's exactly the same as can we introduce a new character, please? I need someone to kill. Oh, I can't kill anybody here. We'll just introduce a new character right now. Yeah, brilliant. Can you just turn up? Say something nice to the the screen about your uh, white picket fence. Thank you very much. Now you've said that. If you could just go over there to die. Brilliant. And the book is the same. Introduce a really powerful device that nobody's ever heard of just so you've got something to destroy. Really lazy. Yeah. I'm glad it was the button that solves the problem. Like I said... That might have been a bigger twist, actually. Oh, my God. It's actually useful. Oh, it actually heard. worked. Or, oh, God, Wanda's got it. Oh, no. Well, yeah, absolutely. What's worse than somebody having the dark hold? Somebody having the dark hold and the light hold. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that could have beefed that up, I suppose. Who knows? I'm getting back to America, the character, not the country. Ooh, I'm just going to keep saying that. Letting my anger get away with me. There you go. I think you pronounce her name as Sushi Gomez. Her name starts with an X, which is difficult for me to pronounce because I've never heard her name spoken before which is something I maybe should have looked up before we did this but I didn't never mind but she was really good I think she worked really well in the scenes that she was in her and Benedict Cumberbatch had a good dynamic she was likable the arc of I need to control my power is pretty obvious you see that in everything every origin story is that isn't it I don't know how to use these powers now I know how to use these powers yeah and then she starts learning how to do magic as well but she's pretty early on in that process. It may not be an interesting thing, but way back before the pandemic, in the before time, as Kat likes to call it, this was supposed to be out before Spider-Man, which makes sense when you consider the fact that Spider-Man actually did more multiverse stuff than this did in a lot of ways. Mm. In that universe where this film comes out first, America turns up in Spider-Man and helps out with that. So the Portal stuff they had Ned doing was supposed to be her in the original conception of spider-man no way home oh i would have preferred that actually because having ned suddenly getting all those weird powers was a bit odd i was okay with it in the context of the film it's apparently magic runs in our family i feel a tingling in my fingers consult a physician it was all very funny and then turns out no he does have that leaning you're the only one without superpowers so we better give you them to you quick but we had to put Stephen Strange on top of Mount Everest before he could open a portal and now ned just kind of does it i don't know what the dynamic of that film would have been like had america been among the young team in No Way Home, but I mean, okay with it, I think. Yeah. I think she would have blended in with them quite well. But that was supposed to be how she fit into that or where she was going next, which yeah. didn't happen, obviously. Well, that's a shame then, because she had something she was going to be. They took it off her and didn't give her anything to replace it. Yeah. So that is a bit of a shame. Who knows what she'll end up doing next, like I said. Oh, she could happily join Young Avengers and yeah. anything, so hopefully they do give her something. And her multiverse power, what are they going to do with it? Because they do have easy access to the multiverse now. We discussed it after the film, but one of the things that surprised me was how difficult it was to hop between universes in this movie. Because I guess I'm spoiled by things like the Arrowverse and stuff, where they literally just press a button and they can go wherever they want. <laughs> That's an example of me bringing different expectations with me. But the fact that it was difficult was an interesting problem. And especially when it came to the end where I'm stuck in this universe, but America's in my universe and I need to help her. The only thing I can do is use this forbidden book, which does neatly bring me back to the whole rules thing, because in Moon Knight, we saw an example of a dead body being possessed and there was no souls of the damned trying to stop them. Yeah, it's fine. (laughs) It wasn't for very long before those souls kicked in as well. Oh, they were right there. And it did get the cool visual of the cloak of dead souls and whatever, which was cool. I like the zombie strange stuff. I will never try and say that this film didn't look good. It looked amazing. They put a lot of effort into that and I cannot deny that everything you've just said about that, yeah, totally true. But even though you acknowledge that America is a plot device, she could be a book, she could be an amulet, she could be a some other magical thing, did you like her as a character? Do you think she worked well, at least in scenes with other people? As a character, no. I thought the actress worked well with the scenes that she was given and she played well opposite the other people. They gave the actress nothing and yet she was still able to create a likeable person out of it. So the character, absolutely not. But yeah, the actress was good. I will give you that. So there's potential there as far as you're concerned. Oh, yeah. Give this actress a better film where she actually gets a script undoubtedly i would watch that yeah and we have a collection of younger characters that she could fit nicely in with we've already talked about the spider-man characters but ms marvel who we haven't met yet at the time of recording yeah 
Totally. Stuff like that. Kate Bishop. Kate Bishop's a bit older, but yeah, still. Again, would still work well enough, yeah. I do think Young Avengers is where they're going. At least that's one of the things that they're going to do at some point. You're going to have a team of young superpower people teaming up and doing stuff. And based on what we've seen character-wise, yep, that would work. We should really talk about Wong, because he is quite a big part of this film, and we have been enjoying him for quite a while now, I think. In all of his appearances, we always compliment the way he was used. Shang-Chi, for example, he was really new he was there with his weird little hustle fighting the abomination and karaoke stuff, and then Spider-Man, he was used quite well. So in this, what did you think of Wong in this film? Do you think he was used well? Not amazingly well. It was fine. Got some jokes in. He was better when he was chatting with other characters they're all playing off other characters in the final scene where he's just hanging off a mountain no why bother why did you even bring any of that in i'm sure at some point he says something to strange and says remember this important point and strange says oh yeah fair enough i will now act differently because of you saying that and it all felt a bit forced i can't even remember what it was i was so unenamored with it i think it's when he says to strange you need to take america's power good grief in that case they even reversed his whole point of being there where he's someone who actually tells strange the truth and gets him to pay attention i blank that and i'm glad you've given me my anger (laughs) i can can rave against that as well it's one of those because the plot needs it darling why would wong say that because the plot needs somebody to say it well do you know what it shouldn't have done the plot should have been stronger yeah so that strange can say i'm not going to do that well, ex- exactly. It just gives him someone to react to. He just needed someone to talk to. It should have been obvious from Strange's own development, his choice to do it. You didn't need it at the start when we were seeing Strange through the vision. You shouldn't have needed it here now. He should have just been tempted to do it and was obvious from the look on his face. Right? I'm putting Wong in the mistreated characters camp as well. He was just there to be another device for Stephen. Lazy, crappy annoying not clever enough stuff i had some questions about his tactics in this film such as getting steven to go and do stuff when he could have gone and done it is it because he can't fly i'm not buying that but he makes steven go and have the conversation with wanda even though he probably knows how it's going to end which is something he does a couple of times actually he seems to delegate stuff to strange that shouldn't be delegated to strange because he's a known loose cannon that tends to make a mess of stuff and it's not like he's a busy Sorcerer Supreme because he doesn't appear to be that busy at all. Yeah, so. but he does have that authority to him, which are quite like the turning Camertage into a fortress and marshalling the troops and stuff like that. I believe his authority, I believe that people listen to him and respect him and I believe that he knows what he's doing as well. But it's just another one of those ones where then the actor does a good job with what they're given, but actually what they're given is just now. Yeah, he isn't used terribly well in this film, but I think we've bigged him up and unexpected ways because of how he's used in other films as well. We just expect him to be up to some antics, and then when you find out he's a Sorcerer Supreme, you're thinking, why does he go off and have cage fights with the Abomination? Yeah, I'm totally over that. This is how he relaxes <laughs> after a busy day at Supreming. Everyone needs a hobby. <laughs> but it turns out that in the role of actually being Sorcerer Supreme, he's got nothing to do because actually Stephen's doing it all. Would have preferred to have seen him as a busy person and then seeing Stephen fail to deal with it as he would have liked and say, all right, I'm going to have to step up. So he doesn't even get to be Sorcerer Supreme. He's just another figurehead person who has to force somebody beneath him to recognise his power. Even that's an ego that I wouldn't have given to Wong. And I feel like America gets one of his lines, actually. The line that's essentially, hang on, so she's the one trying to capture or kill me or whatever, and you're told her where to find me. I think that would have fitted better coming from Wong. Okay, so you told her the place that she needs to go, and then, yep, okay, we need to make this a fortress now. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, comedy back and forth. Go have a chat with her. Try not to screw it up this time. Why don't you do it? As far as the connection to Wanda goes, Wong has as much of a connection to her as he does. It may have been interesting, actually. Obviously, Doctor Strange is the title of the film, so he has to do all the stuff. But it may have been interesting if Wong had a go, and then he failed... They could have done a bit of, what do they call it, in media res where you're halfway through something. It could have been, where's Wong? Oh, he went to speak to Wanda. Did he? Okay, better look into that because he didn't come back. I mean, that would have changed the plot completely. But the point is, they could have given him some think beforehand. And it's Stephen's perspective. The film is Stephen, so we just see it all through his perspective of discovering it halfway through. But no, not clever. 
Well, there is actually a deleted opening where Mordo, the 616 version of Mordo, was trying to track down Wanda because he's still in his remove magic from people who don't deserve it quest, and she kills him. It was deleted because that gives away that she's the villain too early. Right, yeah, that, yeah that's true. That is people making some effort to... Yeah, Wong went to speak to Wanda about a week ago, and we haven't seen him since. What happened to him? Could be interesting. I do think they could have done more with a he's the Sorcerer Supreme and Steven isn't side of things because they could have really played around with that. He clearly thinks he should have the job. Again, you have the he bows to him, which is recognising his authority. There's a few arcs that Stephen could have followed in this and they kind of picked bits of each of them. They did that with something else as well, actually. When I saw music by Danny Elfman at the end, that triggered that same thought. Oh yeah, I do remember. Halfway through this, you suddenly get the music and the visuals of a fairy tale where she's breaking through the mirrors. Mm. But then that's the only part of it that's a fairy tale. And it comes back at it at the end because being defeated by the emotions of seeing two of your own children scared of you, that's a fairy tale ending almost. Yeah, a traditional fairy tale ending as opposed to a Disney fairy tale ending. Yeah, absolutely. But it's just two points that are randomly in something that I'm going to say is trying to be a horror and, again, didn't really do it for me. And then other parts of it that is Marvel is an action film. You get these thoughts of, well, I'd rather you have picked one. If you'd have told me a fairy tale right from the beginning, you could have made it a horror fairy tale because you've gone in, as you say, traditional, down the proper Grimm's fairy tales route where it's a bit nasty. No, I don't want to do that. So why just bring these points in? It was the same for me as when they have the fight at the end and Strange says, oh, musical notes. I can use magic on them. Why did you even need? Surely you could have used magic for anything. Oh, you wanted to make it a cool-looking scene. Right, okay, not interested. No, I need it to mean something a bit more than that. But it really did feel like somebody at all points was reaching for, how can we make this look cool or sound cool? Fairy tale will do. Don't want to commit to it, but it'll make this scene good. I think that's a problem throughout. As an aside, I did like the musical battle, although it wasn't as good as when they did it in Legion. Well, if you're going to go nuts, you've got to go Legion. That's the only way. It's Diet Legion. We discussed that during Midnight as well. <laughs> That's what we're getting. But the fairy tale thing, they're almost challenging you to see the differences because Snow White's on the TV as that sequence is playing out as well. Oh, really? The 838 version of Snow White, which, based on the clip we saw, seems to be identical to the 616 version of Snow White, as far as we know. So it's two identical films were made in different universes. But again, everyone's the same across the multiverse, which is very odd. It's a good time to come on to the multiverse then. We talked about how the multiverse as it is, this is really the two universes by way of the multiverse, I suppose, because they go through a bunch of universes to get to the other one. Well, three universes, actually. There's a third one because the Doctor Strange with the musical battle, that's in the third universe, but mainly two. And we get a glancing view of the multiverse as he travels through it. Were you okay with that? Did you want more multiverse stuff? Or were you fine with the fact that we're going to spend most of our time in just two similar universes? The other one is weird because it has a different colour scheme and we walk on red instead of green, which is something they mention in Legion as well, where John Hamm says, if someone changed your perception of that, you would get run over, which is... Kind of what happens to Stephen here. I didn't need more universes or less universes. I remember that Chris commented on that when we came out. That's what he was expecting, to see a bit more of the multiverse. Didn't he say we got the madness, but not the multiverse? And I think, fair enough, that would have been a way of showing us something more interesting than what we got. But I think for me... To make that decision, I would have needed to have seen a script. I'm going to come back to that. I would have needed to have seen the plot to see whether it needed me to do more multiverse hopping. If that have lent more into America Chavez, then I would say, yep, that sounds like I need more multiverses because that's pretty much who she is. Because every time something happens, she gets frightened and then maybe she gains her power. And instead of it just coming up when she gets frightened, she starts to use it to actively run away And then at the end, Stephen manages to get up to her and say, you need to stop being afraid and you need to face your fear and you need to tackle it. But in the end, apparently he was afraid and she wasn't. So even that doesn't get any use. So have an idea and commit to it. And if it had been America as the idea, I would have said, yes, more multiverses, please. If they'd have focused more on Stephen, then three of him, I think, is enough. More than that would have been 
too many unless you just flick through them at high speed and you have a comedy moment where he's looking in the mirror and he sees 50,000 versions of himself but to actually get into a detailed Stephen plot I think three universes was about right for me so to answer your question I would have to say which script do you want me to answer it for and I'll give you a better answer it's kind of four universes really because we saw a little bit of the 838 strange but yeah I see where you're coming from the America version you could have a plot where she gains control of her power as in she can use it whenever she wants but she can't control where she goes so then you have this extended chase through the multiverse where they keep hopping to universities because they're trying to get back to 616 and can't as opposed to we're stuck here in this other universe but yeah it's that matter of perspective isn't it if dr strange is the focus here then we only need a couple of him we don't need millions of them or you can have a comedy scene where he consults a council of himself like Kang does yeah. in the Avengers cartoon that we've both seen. Maybe that's something you'll do in future, now that he knows about the multiverse. We'll all get together and yeah. have a chat about stuff. I'll make an Illuminati of myself across the multiverse. Yeah, I could totally get into that, yeah, because it's about him. But to get into his character, I need to see him in detail. I can't see him briefly. Yeah, I was surprised that they were leaning into, you're the same guy in all universes, none of you can be trusted, because the whole point of the multiverse is that there is a difference to it. And even then, he uses what he knows about another mortal to get one up on the version that's in front of him. Yeah, you were always jealous of me, you hated me, and I'm pretty sure you hated me here too, and... Turns out he was right. It would have been more interesting if he'd not risen to it. He'd be like, no, we're good friends. I miss you every day, that kind of stuff. So he just doesn't rise to it. But I quite liked when Mordo was shouting after him and he doesn't even stick around to listen. That was a nice subversion of that. I'm going to stand up here and gloat. He knows he doesn't have time for it, so he runs off. But that was a nice little touch there. As Mordo was just yelling after him, annoyed. I'm not sure what answer I'm looking for then in terms of the two possibilities that you've outlined. So which one would you have preferred? Would you have preferred then a massive chase through the multiverse? Or do you think it's fine what they were trying to do here as in this is an exploration of who Doctor Strange is by giving you a few examples of slightly different Doctor Stranges? Based on the villain we've been given in Scarlet Witch, I would choose to drop America Chavez. She could have been an item, so commit to that rather than treating her being that badly. So drop that whole thing. So a multiverse portal machine of some sort. Well, magic. There's just magic that allows you to do it. Some magic is out of control. One of the consequences of either Strange using the Darkhold or the chaos magic that is Wanda breaks the universe and traveling is somehow permitted based on that. In control or out of control, doesn't matter. But have that replaced by some sort of magical consequence of their choices and then go deeper into Doctor Strange's emotional development through this story. It was supposed to be about his emotional development to get over Christine. I think I would have liked to have seen some form of, you have become this person that you needed to be in order to save the multiverse, but in doing so, you've lost a bit of yourself. Let's let you get yourself back. And in getting yourself back, you are able to give Wanda some information that allows her to process it. Or you realize through your own emotional development that you can see in Wanda's mind and you can predict what's going to happen when she meets her children. So it seems like you're throwing her kids under the bus. You're making this big call and you're prepared to sacrifice two little children to get what you want. But actually the reveal is... No, you've learned a wisdom. It's not just a strategic thing for you now. You can actually see human emotions and you value them. And because you can see the emotional development, you know that when she meets her children, it's going to go a certain way. Congratulations, you've earned wisdom. And so three universes where Doctor Strange gets to see more into his own mind, into his own heart through the perspective offered by three broken strangers he can get that development that's what i'd pick i'd say don't need to see too many multiverses but i want to see the three or four of them give us more info on strange bring him into the four 
and get him to go through an actual emotional journey rather than just pretend to at the end. Basically, we're shortening the title to Doctor Strange in the Multiverse. Fair enough. Yes, why not? I'm sure a different title more might have been needed, <laughs> but yes. But that's essentially what you're saying. You want Doctor Strange to explore the multiverse and therefore himself in the process. Yes, a multiverse of Stranges or something. Absolutely, yeah, that would have been better for me. Which is essentially what Peter Parker does in the most recent film. It is, actually. Maybe that would have been considered too much of a copy, but I don't think so, given that it's got Wanda in there to mix it up. He's exploring his inner psyche while being chased by an insane witch. By something that is so powerful that even the Sorcerer... I know he's not the Sorcerer Supreme, but somebody who is powerful enough to be the Sorcerer Supreme, even that character can't tackle a chaos magician who's given herself over to a dark god. And you think, yup, this is a moment of humility for you. There is no way you can see through it. And he's constantly, how am I going to do it? What am I going to do? And eventually he has to realize that, do you know what? This is not a problem to be solved with magic. This is a problem to be solved with familial connections and realizing that it's just a human thing that we need to tackle. on. I guess that way they could have actually done something with the sudden reveal that he has a dead sister that we didn't need because he could have gone to a universe where the sister didn't die and then done something with that. Oh, it actually turned it into a, an actual plot point. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, why not? Yeah, that could have worked. It is part of his backstory in the comics, which some people use as a justification for why it's in there, but it's only in there so that the two Stranges can recognise that they are both Stephen Stranges. So it's no real purpose because he could have said, no. you hid biscuits in a box under a floorboard when we were both children. And it's like, yeah, I, I used to do that. Yeah, yeah. And I've told nobody that. It accomplishes the same thing. Other than that thing that, well, we didn't talk about, but Chris and I did during the Picard podcast. Has, and everybody has a bloody tragic backstory. Everybody needs one because that's the only way you can ever connect to someone emotionally, according to some writers. I think it's come out of a development in modern psychology that is being pushed. And anything that goes in like that goes into other media. I see it often enough in my own job. Something comes in as part of a radical new way of thinking and all of a sudden business thinks that it needs to be done it as well. No, you're failing to do that. Don't pick up a hammer and start thinking you can paint your car with it. No, <laughs> stop it. So that could have been an interesting thing. And equally the other plot, which is jumping through different universes because America can't control where she goes. And then she has some revelation that allows her to control where she goes towards the end or something, who knows. But that would have been another way to have a bit of fun with the multiverse in terms of seeing different universes. I'll come back to Earth 838 in a minute. Just to say, I could have watched that film you've just said. I think I would have needed to have taken Wanda out of it for that. But yeah, I could have watched that film as well. Yeah, unless Wanda's somehow chasing them. She catches up to them and follows them through, but they run away, I don't know. You could have done something with it. I'll come back to 838 in a minute as a universe, but something stood out to me when you talked about the whole chaos magic versus sorcery, because I know you like your labels on these things, your Dungeons and Dragons type, here's this spell and whatever. Label sounds like a dangerous word, by the way. I'll just say I like to know what the rules are, that's all. Yes, okay. So what did you think of the whole... One line from Wong that established witchcraft is different from sorcery. It's a different kettle of fish entirely. What did you think of that? Because I had assumed up until that point they were essentially the same thing. They were different branches of the same thing, but Wong suggested that they're entirely different. So just wondering what you... As your D&D background. Well, strangely, people rail against D&D, by the way, in the gaming community for its simplicities and things that it does wrong but the one thing it does do well that gives it a large fan base is it sets out a good rule set which when it's subverted you notice it meaningfully if somebody suddenly does something that they can't do the players all sit around and go oh, okay that was weird I'm like <laughs> suddenly scared and the person running the game knows that right i've got you i have hit an emotional core inside you here that I can now play with. And for something that is known as not having much in the way of subtlety and, and nuance is D&D, because it is a bit of a strategy game, the idea that it can then do that emotional thing better than this film, I think, is something people should open their eyes to. But it just comes back to exposition again. It's somebody, I am going to say something to you such that the following thing has meaning. No, that's not going to give it emotional meaning. You need to set it up as part of the entire film. And do you know what? You've had Doctor Strange 1, Doctor Strange 2. We've had 
wandering, various things. She's had her own TV series. You've had plenty of time to set up the rules of magic. You've had plenty of time to just sneak these things in and tell me what works and what doesn't. But they don't do it. They just say, I put four runes around a room. And if you blink at the right point in this time frame, then the runes will activate and it will draw your power. But I'm having to explain that to you right now so you know that it's important. When you could have just been peppering runes throughout the whole series, where she stumbles across a rune and makes something of it rather than just explaining it to me at the end. And you're just telling me that chaos magic is something different now. Fine, but you've got creatures popping out of the woodwork telling me that something is banned. This is forbidden. By who? Who writes these rules? Is it the power of all the sorcerer supremes across the universe who've just put these rules in place? If it's the dark gods, well, then they're not the dark gods are selling themselves short because surely they would want to corrupt people doing this. But the spirits know that it's against the rules and they feel the need to explain it to you. The reason we're doing this is because it's against the rules, not because we're evil spirits and we just want to eat you because we've been twisted by magic. Then we need to explain that it's against the rules, but it hasn't come up before. So it's exactly the same as, I need someone to die. Oh, I can't break the contracts of my regular actors. Can we just bring somebody new on to die, please? It can never have emotional value if you just say chaos magic is different to sorcery. And that's why we can't do anything here. I needed to hear that in Doctor Strange 1 or at the start of Doctor Strange 2, like the dead body setup, which I've said, I still find it a bit gimmicky. But if you bleed it into everything, just subversively putting it in everywhere, and you do it like D&D does it. Sorcery solves this problem. Sorcery solves this problem. Sorcery solves this problem. And then sorcery suddenly fails. You don't need to explain chaos magic is different. You just see that it is. Stephen Strange just beats everybody with sorcery, and then he tries to do it to Wanda, and she just laughs. Uh -huh, I've got the power of the Dark God behind me. You lose! And Stephen's own face can look horrified as he realises that his sorcery has no effect on chaos magic. And it's something that he learns and we learn it with him. And all you have to do throughout the film is do exactly what I just said. Sorcery solves this problem. Sorcery defeats this issue. Sorcery overcomes this villain. And then the rule that you've set up with no exposition at all is subverted in front of you. Show, don't tell. It comes back to the same principle every single time. So the fact that Wong told us that, literally don't care because it's just as pointless as the spirit saying you've broken the rules. Not clever enough. Comes back to the same thing I've been saying throughout all of this. Not clever enough. Don't just tell me. Because you've got this problem as well with magic. Suspension of disbelief. How are you going to bring that in? How are you going to make sure that this is essentially the same as advanced science? You do it through exactly the same setup by putting in points during the film where the sorcery obeys the certain rule set, which we do with technology all the time. There's gravity here. There's gravity here. There's gravity here. I'm floating. Oh. Something's going on. I know it is because I've seen a lot of gravity before. It is actually the same setup. I'm not honestly sure what I'm supposed to get from the line of Wong telling me that. And so I guess to answer your question, even though I've done that in a roundabout way, what do they think of it? I thought nothing of it. Bit of a waste of time. They are obviously rooted in the same thing, though, because both sets of powers can use the dark hold. So there's a definite connection there. But yeah, I'd like to know why sorcerers don't use witchcraft and vice versa. The annoying thing as well is it's such an emotive label, and I will bring that back. I try to avoid the word label, but here I think I can use it because we have been clear in our MCU work that witchcraft is the thing that can still be associated with the Salem witch trials and the mistreatment of women. It's kind of the dark side of the force in the way that they're setting it up in the films, I guess, or in the shows as well. But if you're going to do that, how do you avoid that trope? How do you go in to your film saying we're going to be diverse and inclusive, but by the way, we're still going to have witchcraft as a thing, as a type of magic? I think they would have been better off saying we use sorcery, but these people that were wrongly and inappropriately labeled as witches in the past is just how the bigoted authority around them referred to chaos magic because they didn't like it and they couldn't control it 
And you know what? Previous Sorcerer Supremes, who may well have been male, labeled it as horrible witchcraft because they wanted to turn people away from it and see sorcery good and witchcraft bad. So you, you've got this baggage that comes with it. And it's really funny then to see that all this effort put in to say, we in Marvel think that diversity is great and we're bringing in women and we're bringing in same sex relationships and we're doing all this good stuff. And then they just seem to miss the point with the word witchcraft, that that's got a history to it. And you can say, oh, yeah, it's been recovered because you've got wicker and you've got white magic as well as dark magic and so on. But unless you're going to give all that during your setup and your rules, then we, the audience, are just going to bring our baggage in with us. And our baggage includes all that trouble with labeling somebody a witch, labeling a woman a witch. So it feels like, oh, missed a trick there. Or you just rolled over it in a massive Land Rover and said, who cares? I think it's another bit that's a bit lazy and a bit dangerous because of it. What you said there is essentially the Force, isn't it? What makes the dark side of the Force the dark side of the Force? The fact that these people that have decided that it's the dark side are afraid of it. It's not by itself a bad thing. It's just something that we've closed ourselves off because we're afraid of it for whatever reason. So you could have all that. You could have bits and pieces of that. But then it almost looks back to the mad woman reading, doesn't it? This is only ever used by mad women that we need to avoid. That's where the danger comes in. Now we've said that, I'm starting to understand what they were talking about with the mad woman thing, because I didn't think of that before with the witchcraft, so I'll take that on board. But I don't think anybody, or not saying anybody, I don't think many people that are making that reading would necessarily have picked up on it because it is just essentially a throwaway line. It's your excuse to bring Wanda into the plot. There was runes on that weird creature. Witchcraft. Let's go speak to a witch. And that's it. And then you sort of forget about it and you move on because the, the plot kicks in after that point. But we've just spent like five minutes talking about it. So there's obviously something there. Anyway, back to Earth 838. Did you find the actual universe there interesting? I didn't because it's not really different enough. Okay, you cross on red instead of green. Big deal. Which is apparently a reference to the TV show Sliders, which I haven't seen that happens in the very first episode. Well, I used to like that show. Someone told me that and that's the reference there. So reference acknowledged, I guess. We did it. We got that in there. But in terms of universe, the sky is a weird colour. There's plants or greenery growing on the side of buildings. There are pizza balls instead of pizza slices, which seems like a weird concept because you're just holding molten cheese, which doesn't sound appealing at all. We're sophisticated and we're really wise and strong of heart because we don't use money and you people are all selfish and evil. Don't use money for food anyway. It's free in most universities, whereas we suck and charge people for food, which is topical considering what's going on at the moment. It is, but it's just such a lazy way of thinking about things. People who don't understand how the world was built, I just want to lump these people in with the same people who say, I just don't understand why there can't be peace war is bad why haven't we gotten rid of war peace is just so much better of course it freaking is but it's the harder part of it it's easier to do one thing than the other and you have to put a lot of effort in and you've also got to have control over your world such that there's no problem with resources oh and by the way if you removed all human emotion that would make it much <laughs> easy think about these statements before you just throw them out there and try and reduce the complexities of the modern world into a simple throwaway line that makes you, the writer, seem great and the rest of us seem like we're just pitiful humans at the feet of your majestic godhood. It narks me when you get throwaway lines like that. In a world where food is free, why is someone giving it away on a cart at the side of the road? That doesn't seem like something you would need to do. The problem is it just doesn't bear analysis because they've just said the world is exactly the same, but we've got this wisdom in. We all appreciate that. We all want world peace. But you know what? Put the frickin' effort in then if you really want it. Yeah, so 838 isn't anything really, it's just a slight visual shift. It looks basically the same as the other New York except rainbow-coloured sky and pizza balls. Pizza balls are just something I don't understand. Seems like a very messy thing to eat. It's something that stood out to me. The film put a lot of stuff into making sure that it was visually impressive and that's yeah. all it was. For. But it is home to the Illuminati, which is a big deal, kind of. Although also not a big yeah. deal. The Council of Cameos, as I could have put it in the notes, but I didn't. I just came up with it right now, and I love it. Council of Cameos. Fair enough. On the Illuminati, in this universe, the Illuminati are a group of elite, you have to guess, unelected people that just decide how things work. Yes, total jerks. 
And they're so arrogant. Well, that's in line with the comics. The Illuminati is not a good idea. I suppose it's not a good name. If you pick that name and you haven't said, hang on, are we the bad guys? If you haven't gone through that conversation, then... It's kind of the Avengers, in a way, but not really. Sort of Avengers if they ruled the world, maybe. You don't have enough context, but it seems like they do. No. They do a lot of influencing, whether that be known that they're doing influencing or not, they are doing influencing, such as we need to control the public perception of our Stephen Strange and turn him into a hero, even though he wasn't. Or even though we don't think he was. Maybe he was. Who knows? So, what you're saying to me is then, Stephen Strange wasn't really evil. He was the only good guy there, and the evil Illuminati all clubbed together to get rid of him, because he was saying, can we do nice things? And they all just said, no, God, no. (laughs) So on the Council of Cameos, we have Captain Peggy Carter, who's not the same one we assume from... What if? Just another one. There's more than one. Cool. Multiverse. Whatever. So your Captain America stand-in. You have the Captain Marvel stand-in, who is the Maria Rambo, Lashana Lynch version, who wasn't Captain Marvel in Captain Marvel, but she is now in this universe. You have Mordo, I guess. He's on there by default somehow. Or maybe he's just their errand boy. I don't know. He just brings the people in to organise their meetings and whatever else, because he does say the Illuminati will see you now, which might suggest that he's not part of it. Doesn't matter. Mordo is an afterthought. We had a set up with Mordo in the previous Doctor Strange movie that we're apparently just not going to deal with here. Just yeah. get rid of. Yeah. <laughs> it's just not happening. So we've got that. And we also have Black Bolt, or his actual name, Blackagar Boltagon, played by Anson Mount, reprising his role from the much maligned, fairly maligned Inhuman series. It's dreadful. It's very bad, but he's there. And the surprises, quote-unquote, one of them was in the trailer. We have Charles Xavier, played by Patrick Stewart. And we also have Reed Richards, a.k.a. Mr. Fantastic, played by John Krasinski. And that last one is the realisation of a meme. Because for whatever reason, it was decided by the internet that Emily Blunt and John Krasinski are married, so they should be Reed Richards and Sue Storm. Or Mr. Fantastic and the Invisible Woman. reasons anything based on this film. Basically, it's that thing I keep saying about when fan casting happens, it means that they get bundled in a van, they don't get a choice, and they get to play these characters. And I was reading, it seems to be common knowledge now, might be misreported, might not, that Daniel Craig was originally supposed to be Mr. Fantastic. But the suggestion is that he was supposed to play Baldur the Brave, who is Thor's brother. We have a Thor equivalent as this guy. So there was that possibility, but Daniel Craig declined because COVID was rife at the time and he didn't want to travel and put anybody at risk his family and stuff like that so you get John Krasinski fulfilling a meme you've already said you hated the Illuminati as a concept I thought it was great I wanted to see it and I wanted them to go into the these are bad people they shouldn't be in charge of anything who put them in charge of anything why do they get to decide these things but instead it was just a bit of an exposition dump we're here to slow the film down for a bit we're going to explain why the Doctor Strange in this universe died and we're going to be ignorant about the danger that's approaching. You deserve to be murdered because you ignored this clear threat. So we can handle the Scarlet Witch. And the bit that they didn't put in the film that I alluded to earlier was apparently they made the decision to lobotomize that Wanda so that she could never be that powerful. That was what was supposed to be in there. And that would have been an interesting way of putting in the, these aren't really a great idea. Yeah, they could have shown how evil they were with that. Because then you have the question of why isn't this Wanda as powerful but still has powers and that's how you get around that and not the first time Xavier's done this in a film to be fair no and it would have actually made him a bit more effective than he was in here because they just made the character useless in this this is the most powerful psychic or telepath that you've got in there and he he just turns up and he seems confused by brain space doesn't seem to know anything that's going on he can't surmise anything from his vast quantities of experience He has no power in brain space where the chaos magic presumably can get into. Well, it did. It's chaos magic. I understand why he wouldn't have ultimate power, but I certainly would have expected him to be more useful than just a frightened little bunny rabbit. Yeah, put up a fight of some sort. Yeah, put up some kind of reserves. Just a waste of time, the whole thing. In thinking back to when I first saw it, I've only seen it twice. I always get excited when they do these things, when they bring these things in. And the Reed Richards thing, it almost overpowers the scene because I certainly stopped listening to what was being said after that point. The first time anyway, because I was so caught up in that, oh, they did this. They actually did this. And it almost made me forget about the fact that, well, they're not doing anything with these characters. In fact, the whole John Krasinski thing runs counter to what I expect from Reed Richards. Again, you've seen him in the Avengers cartoon and in the comics, Reed Richards is very high functioning. So the the whole thing is he doesn't understand how 
quote unquote normal people's brains work because he operates on a completely different wavelength. That's something that Sue brings to their relationship. She's the one that helps him understand humanity and so on and stops him from diverting off to this mental plane of existence that he lives on. She keeps him grounded in that way. So when you have him trying to emotionally appeal to Wanda by saying, I have kids too, I get it, I understand how you're feeling. He wouldn't understand how she's feeling. But this is me extrapolating from the comic book version of Reed Richards. Yeah, I wouldn't have known that. But then if you're just going to make him this emotionally aware guy, then why are you doing Reed Richards? Yes. What makes him stand out from the other geniuses you've had? What makes him different from Banner or Stark or indeed Strange? Because they all have an emotional awareness, whereas he shouldn't be able to speak to Wanda on that level. And there's a meme going around as well where he explains that Black Bolt can kill you with a single word. And then she's like, well, okay, I'll shut his mouth then. And then that's it. There's a meme going around. If he doesn't say that, they win. But he is introduced as the smartest man on the planet or whatever it is. But they're just there as an exposition piece to say the right things to set up the plot. They're just a bunch of straight men that set up the game. It did make me laugh when it was, we'll go off and deal with Wanda and then we'll come back and vote. The most pointless bureaucratic nonsense. I already didn't like them and you're just making me feel it. (laughs) Well, I thought Xavier was the more thoughtful of the bunch because he was the one that believed that Stephen was genuine, I suppose. Fair enough, but given that he was otherwise still a bit useless and they didn't really do anything interesting with them and the fight scene was just stupid... Everything I've already said. Yeah, a couple of things about the fight scene that you didn't like was Peggy just saw the more powerful of the bunch be obliterated and she thought, yeah, I'll have a go. I can throw a shield at her, that should work. But the fact that Scarlet Witch even just carries on, no, it should just be click, you're gone. Bye. I'm just going to walk past you. And apparently all you have to do is flatten Captain Marvel and that kills her. Yeah, nothing good. Based on what you know about the other Captain Marvel, would you expect that? We did see her in What If just levelling a desert in a tussle with Thor. This is what I mean. If they wanted to really do some proper horror with it, then you'd set up how powerful these people actually are, and then you still have Wanda just walk through them. But we didn't. We got a physical fight scene with the statue falling on somebody. We got a physical fight scene with red bolts being pushed around. There is nothing about the power level that was done right here. It just undermines the whole setup of Wanda and who she is. I also think that the intent is that the Illuminati are useless. I think that's what the film's trying to tell you. The fact that Strange mocks them as they're being introduced is quite funny. Blackagar Boltagon, is that your real name? And didn't you chart in the 70s when here's the Fantastic Four? Yeah. You have to imagine that as soon as Strange gets back to his normal universe and things calm down, he goes and finds those people. Because <laughs> wouldn't you? Find out what they're up to. Yeah. The one question I had about the characters that we don't know. So everyone that we know looks exactly like they do in our universe in the baseline MCU. So does that mean that they're tied into definitely casting those people? Does that mean we have to get Xavier played by Patrick Stewart, which is a shame because the guy's in his 80s and probably doesn't want to work for much longer? I was going to say, that's not going to last. I'd rather have a new, younger Xavier to play with. But again, it's the multiverse. You can mix and match, I suppose. They're just bringing a young one. Everybody should have been different in that respect then. But then you wouldn't have had what they wanted. They were going for the visual. They wanted people to look at the screen and go, oh, look at that. They weren't interested in the plot. They were just setups for gags and rubbish horror. So they got what they wanted. Or as the rumour went, you get the Tom Cruise, Tony Stark. And that sets up, not everyone looks the same. Well, I would have actually found that more interesting. Yeah. I don't think the Tom Cruise Tony Stark was ever true, but that's an example. It didn't have to be Tony Stark. It could be anybody. Here's Bruce Banner, and he's a different actor, which we've already experienced. But you know what I mean? Anybody that we know the name of, and it gives you the, okay, so we can't expect all of these people to be the same in the universe that we know. Fine. Move on from that. You're better off just not trying to read anything from that, because that wasn't the reason it was there. The reason it was there was to give you some cheap shots. Yeah, and then people have been saying that the Illuminati should have been more people and perhaps more people from previous properties. So you get the Reed Richards we had before, and then Ben Affleck's Daredevil, people have suggested. Why would he be on an elite society? The thing of it is, it talked about what would I have preferred to have seen, and I've said I could have gone down two routes. I could have gone down the America Chavez route, removing Wanda, and I could have gone down the Stephen Strange route by removing America Chavez if... I'd have gone down the first one and been happy with that film. And you need to remove Wonder, who's chasing them through the multiverse, the Illuminati. And it could be different ones at different points. And you don't really 
understand what's going on, but they could have their own reasons for doing it because we think he's going to cause an incursion. We think he's going to do that. We just don't like him because he's going to cause us trouble. We fear losing our power and we fear losing our power to her. She has caused all of these things. She's done this, that and the other. So if you put the Illuminati in, you've got to put them in throughout to make them interesting rather than these cameos. Yeah. And then there was a rumour that Nick Cage's Ghost Rider was going to turn up and stuff, which didn't happen, but may have been filmed. We don't know. Tobey Maguire, Spider-Man, etc. There was all those rumours everywhere. A true cameo where they just walk through and say, hello, bye. That could have been funny. Who the hell was that? What just went by on that bike? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is the horror universe. Yeah, where everything's bad. Just thinking the Ben Affleck Daredevil, you could have quite a diverse Illuminati. We've got a guy that can't walk, a guy that can't talk, a guy that can't see. Yeah, ben Affleck's Daredevil. As if he should be in charge of anything. I mean, none of them should be, but it just wouldn't make any sense. Although, speaking as a fan, it was great to see... Patrick Stewart play the live action version of the animated Xavier in his chair and everything. This chair that he was drowning in. And you had the stab at the theme as well as he entered. That was, again, a nice touch. It does what it sets out to do, as in the, oh yeah, I recognise that. But that's all of it. And then you have the meta side of it where you have two captains from Star Trek sharing the screen at the same time. (laughs) With the wrong one in the chair, funnily enough. Nothing much to the Illuminati then, really. It would have been really good to see Wanda fighting Captain Marvel, but having a proper fight where they're both at full strength. Because I don't believe that you can just flatten Captain Marvel and that's the end of her. Any of them. It would, but even that wouldn't have fixed it for me. It needed a whole redo. I did like the sequence, though. It was funny seeing Reed Richards turned into cheese string, essentially. Just unraveled. That's the bit that works. Defeat Black Bolt, defeat cheese string, and then defeat the others in the same way. Just walk through them. They are nothing to you. If you want to bring the horror in commit to that don't just turn it to action yeah because peggy's the one that lasted the longest really she's the easiest to beat just to ignore her she keeps throwing a shield at you you don't even look in her just direction. swat it out of the way she jumps at you you still don't even look in her direction she's just a fly and that's upsetting for her but then that could have been the bit where she says right i'm clever i'm not going to keep doing that because it didn't work i'm going to try and talk to her so many things it could have been, but yeah, we've talked about Could you imagine Steve Rogers trying to fight Wanda? He wouldn't do it. No, but the whole point of Steve is that he knows when to start using the Steve that he was before he gained the superpower. That's the whole point of his character. That's the reason why the Doctor picks him to be Captain America. And so he would be exactly the right person to do what you have talked about Hawkeye doing. Put my shield down, we're going to talk. Wouldn't have worked, didn't need to work, but anyway, I'm getting angry. <laughs> so I think we're both agreed on the Illuminati. They're not a bad idea in principle. I think they could have just, as you say, done so much more with them. They could have been more than just a, here's a diversion for 10 or so minutes. These bumbling, idiotic figureheads, especially in the mistrust of government that we all share as a society, as a, a world at the moment, that's a, a very relevant thing. This unelected group making all the decisions. They unfortunately don't really do much with it. Just make them sit around and explain why they killed their Stephen Strange. There was a big thing where Elizabeth Olsen passed a lie detector test when she was asked if she'd ever met John Krasinski. She said no and then passed the lie detector test. And people were surprised by this because apparently people haven't been filming separately for decades. It's just not been a thing that's been happening in this world that we live in. I think it happens more often than it doesn't now with CGI and stuff. There's people swapped out and replaced and whatever, but it's always been happening. We've had an actor playing the same person twice in a scene in multiple things before, so we've done that. It's fine. I just thought I'd bring that up. Sort of finish up with the action. You've already said that you didn't like all of it. Was there any of it you did like? I've listed them as the horror-driven sequences. You've got Camertage, the Illuminati base, and Zombie Strange, and a bit of the wedding attack. The wedding attack isn't really horror. It's more of a traditional MCU sequence, actually. I couldn't enjoy them for the reasons mentioned, because they seemed so pointless. I know that there was a certain visual spectacle to them all. Like you say, throwing the music at people, it looks great, but I couldn't enjoy any of them because of their pointlessness. The wedding attack at the start is possibly the only one that I would say I enjoyed, if I even really enjoyed it that much. I suppose I did enjoy it. There's a little bit of witty back and forwards, or you're doing this, I'm doing that and what's going on. I use a bit of power to cut a bus in half. Big scary monster. It's simple fare, but it does what it needs to do. And they use a bit of sling ring action to deal with the three-dimensional part of the fight. So I guess the wedding one is that you say it's the traditional Marvel one. And that's fine. It worked for me. I wasn't blown away by it. 
but it worked for me. All of the rest of them couldn't enjoy any of them, but as I say, for the reasons mentioned already. I think the action sequences are a good example of letting the director have free reign, at least to an extent. There's a lot of chat about in the MCU, when they get directors involved, they don't really let them run with what they're doing, which I don't think is an unfair criticism, but I don't think it's as simple as they don't let them do what they get to do. We talked about, again, in Moon Knight, how Mohamed Diab had a lot of freedom, but that's on TV or streaming TV, which is mm. a different animal. And Taika Waititi, no one can argue against the fact that he got to make his own film. He completely did. James Gunn, okay, you don't really know what his style is if you haven't seen much of his stuff, or even if you have, it's difficult to nail down his style, but he made distinct films twice. You can't really see the hands on it, whereas with something like Spider-Man, you can. I would say that Sam Raimi got to do a sort of 60-40 split between his film and a Marvel film, so this wedding attack, it's your traditional Marvel thing, and it looks and feels like a lot of the sequences you've seen before, but at the same time, there is a bit of Raininess in there, such as pulling out the creature's eye, which is meant to be a bit of a comedy beat. Yeah. And then throughout the film, you get different little flavors of Sam Raimi's style, such as when Wanda's about to dreamwalk, the presence that hides behind the staircase, and things like that. That's a proper horror thing. Her coming out of the mirror and being all contorted before putting herself back together in the right way. There's a lot of little horror touches there, and it's never going to go too far because it's a PG-13. And your favourite thing, the dead talking about the rules, even if you don't like what they were doing, the personality that they displayed is very much a Sam Raimi thing, the horror comedy side of it. In Evil Dead, that's what the dead apes were like. They would make fun of their victims as they're savaging them. So that's what that was coming from. So I liked it from that respect. I do feel like it was a Sam Raimi film while also being a Marvel film. But again, during Moon Knight, talked about the interview I did with that director where it's, you choose the topics, but you're still making a pizza. And I think Sam Raimi understood that. Yeah, fair enough. And that's to me, it says that what I accused him of before is unfair because I said that if you override a character to put your thing in, then that's bad. But he wasn't always that way. He did agree to make the pizza. So I wouldn't say that what I said was completely fair about him. And then after the experience he had with Spider-Man 3, you would think he would not really come back to do one of these things unless he had some latitude to make the film that he wants to make in some ways because Spider-Man 3, they made him do stuff that he didn't want to do. And then the result is what it is. Well, well, that turns yeah. Out. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I can see why people think, well, Sam Raimi's been diluted here, but you can almost expect that with a franchise property like this, really. And again, I don't mean that as a criticism because we have seen some great examples of directors getting to do their own thing. Eternals, for example, I think we've talked about before how they filmed on location, which is something that they don't always do in Marvel films. And you can feel it. You can see the wind blowing through their hair and things like that. And it gives you that visceral quality that you just can't replicate in a studio. I do think that this film is probably 90% filmed in front of green screen because it has to be. Multiverses, yeah. <laughs> But at the same time, there is still that director's flair. There's that flavour to it. And I liked all the action to some degree. I enjoyed most of it. Would have liked to see it pushed a bit further. The Illuminati stuff, as we've talked about. Wanda is this unstoppable force. Again, I would have liked to see more of the chase. I just needed it to be a bit more meaningful. I needed it to be built into the script. For me, it just felt like I must suffer this script. I'll put my own take on it and make it look the way I would make it look and succeeded in doing that to put a stamp on it. But I, I need to see it break into the script itself and actually have plot meaning rather than just being nice to look at as it was. So I can't deny that the skill that you're saying is being put into the creation of it. But if it comes down to did I enjoy it? No, because it wasn't relevant. Okay, yeah. yeah it was the Loki writer that wrote this, or one of the Loki writers. Michael Waldron, so take from that what you will. Yeah, I don't know if it was a group or how much influence you had. I'd have to go back and see which parts of Loki you did. Yeah, it's just something worth mentioning. I guess they put them onto this because it's weird like Loki is in some ways. That's the reason, then again, you've not thought through it enough. Yeah. I don't know why they hired him. They just did. Maybe they'd have been hired before Loki came out because remember, this film was supposed to come out quite a while ago. Right, I know. Yeah, it's had a lot of reshoots and what have you. Oh, really? <laughs> I think a lot of the reshoots were putting in the cameos. What would you like for, <laughs> well, who knows? You will never know. One of those eternal questions. So action fine. They did a reasonable job with it for the most part. And some of it looked better than others. The zombie strange one's probably my favourite, just because of how stunning it was with the snowy backdrop and everything. That looked really good. Oh yeah. I won't deny that. The musical battle was good, but again, 
we saw it in Legion. Or was there ever an actual musical battle? There were dance battles. There were dance battles that wasn't actually fighting with notes, but even the dance battle actually fitted more into the <laughs> plot than this. But you actually saw it as a metaphor, whereas the music, it wasn't a metaphor. It was just, I need to throw something at you. Do you? No, you don't. And there was a cartoon battle in Legion as well, where they drew cartoons that made them fight and that stuff. This is the kind of stuff you could be doing with Doctor Strange and you don't. Isaac was torn when he came out of this, actually, because he said, this is weird, I didn't like this, but it gave me everything I ever wanted from a Doctor Strange film. <laughs> get his perspective on that someday. We'll get it in there somewhere, but I wonder if he's resolved that within himself. Implications for the wider MCU that was next on the list. I think we've covered that. It could have massive implications or it could not have massive implications. Oh, yeah. The multiverse can be in play because of America, you have Clea taking Strange to do something, we don't know what. And I suppose you can pick up the whole Illuminati concept, but in our universe in some way. It's more that they've opened the door to literally anything, but they kind of already had opened the door, so it doesn't really properly walk through it in any way yet. But it's still there waiting for Dealing with whether Wanda's dead or not, and subsequent potential redemption arc. Do they want to go more into the Dark Gods? They've just allowed themselves to do so many things yeah so there are implications but we don't know what they are yet is what we're getting at oh let us just wrap up then give the audience your final thoughts on dr strange in the multiverse of madness my final thoughts are it's not the worst film in the mcu because that pride of place still goes to thor 2 but (laughs) Nonetheless, it's pretty far down the list at second worst. And I don't know that it needed to be that way at the start. It wasn't doomed. I do honestly believe that there's a weakness in the script here. Visuals, stunning. The soundtrack, brilliant, engaging. All of that part that comes with the direction, I will not challenge anything that you've said. In fact, I will even agree with it. But I couldn't enjoy any of it because I didn't get anything that I would put to the script side. Doctor Strange just ignored all of his stuff that came before and didn't develop him either. America Chavez was treated really badly. She was essentially a magical item that was carried through and didn't get anything useful to do. No matter how good the actress was, didn't get anything good to do. The villain, the best villain the MCU will ever have. And they didn't do anything with her. They didn't give her enough emotional scenes. They didn't give her any enough talking scenes. They didn't commit to her power level. It's still the best villain takedown, but it wasn't emotional because the film didn't build up to it. So I could have liked various things about this film. I could have liked a film with the duo of Stephen Strange and America Chavez running through the multiverse together. I could have liked a film with Stephen Strange realising that he needed to be humble in the face of the chaos magic of Wanda because it was the one thing that he could not solve. And yet at the end, he solves the problem by being human, which is potentially the thing he'd left behind by becoming the master strategist. There are so many things this film could have been, and it was none of them, so I'm afraid despite looking amazing, didn't enjoy any of it, didn't get any emotional response to it. And that, that's such a shame for, for characters that are so good. But there it is. Okay, my final thoughts are, I enjoyed this film a lot. I didn't get what I was expecting out of it, but I don't mean that in a bad way. It's just that I was expecting to do things that it ended up not doing, and I was okay with what it did. I'm really glad they leaned heavily into Wanda as the villain, and they stuck with that throughout, because it looked like... She would be the villain for a bit, and then they'll see eye to eye, and then she'll help with the real threat. I'm glad they didn't go with that. That would have really annoyed me. I'm I'm glad that she just stayed the villain throughout. So that was good. The Illuminati, good idea. Sloppily executed, and didn't really add anything to it. The multiverse, would I have liked to see more of the multiverse? Maybe. But I was okay with just having the two universities, or three universities, and playing with that. So, yeah, I enjoyed it. Despite its shortcomings, I do think it's a a really good time. And the chase aspect of it actually really worked for me. I felt 
certainly the first time I watched that, I felt really tense as I was going through it, except when the Illuminati kills the pacing. That's a bit annoying, but then that's what we've identified that they're there to do. They're there to just put a stop in there for some reason up until that point. And then when the chase resumed, I was fine. I was back in it and I enjoyed it. So yeah, I liked it a lot. I don't know where it would rank in the midst of the Marvel canon, but that's too hard to even contemplate, especially how new it is and the fact that it might have to move in a couple of months anyway when we see the next thing. It's just the relentless release of these things. It's difficult to put them in context, isn't it? Especially when you're TV show after TV show and film after film. and You'd need to binge them and stay up for 48 hours to do it all. Every single time one comes out. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. It's not happening. But no, I liked this. And I think we've had a good discussion where we've been getting in amongst the detail or lack of detail in certain places. It's rare that we have a podcast where we disagree to this extent. So it's interesting to still get in there. You could almost invite the listeners to say, actually, do you agree with one or the other? You could also leave it open to say if they've got a third opinion somebody who thought eh. <laughs> right in the middle but it might be interesting to say that to the listeners do you agree with craig or do you, do you agree with me well do that listeners we always encourage feedback and we've had a few comments recently as i've shared with you guys on the discord so someone's out there listening so that was our discussion on dr strange in the multiverse of madness i do want to thank neil stenson for the supplied music if you like what you heard, please do hit that subscribe button on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere you get your podcast. Wherever you're listening to this, we'll probably have a subscribe button. Please do press it. And if you're on Apple Podcasts, and I think Spotify lets you rate an app as well, please do leave us a star rating and a comment if you're able to, if the app allows it. And since we're dealing with the multiverse, could we get a multiverse variant that likes instructing people on what stars to give. No, you've already said that we're all the same across the universe, I'm afraid it doesn't change. Maybe that's the one change. Give us what you think we're worth. If you think we're worth two and a half, give us that. If you think we're worth four, give us that. That's what I reckon. If you agree with Aaron, give us five stars. If you agree with me, also give us five stars. If you're sitting on the fence and have a third opinion, also give us five stars. Right. That about sums it up. If you want to talk about this film, Doctor Strange of the Multiverse of Madness, Marvel in general, or anything else really, you can hit us up on Facebook or Twitter under Neil Before Blog, or leave us a comment on neilbeforeblog.co.uk, as I said, some people have been doing. So, great stuff. And as always, we hope you'll join us next time on Neil Before Pod. <laughs>